Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and the gang is back together this week. It's been a while. It has been a while. A while. Uh, head Coach Chad Zimmerman. Hi, everybody. Good to have you, Chad. <laughs> He's high energy today. So high energy. <laughs> Got a bowl full of beer sitting in front of me. <laughs> That's true. If you can join sort us of. on YouTube, you can see that sort of thing. Yeah. Good Good point. Uh, good asterisk on the sort of. And CEO Nate Pearson. Good to have you, Nate. Good to have me, too. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Good to be here. Good to be here. That's yeah, what yeah. I want to say. Uh, so this is actually, just before we go any further, like I said, you can join us on YouTube. Uh, we recommend doing that. It's usually every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific, but we're going to have an unorthodox schedule next week. Uh, because Nate, you and I won't be, uh, well, I should say we'll have a special podcast next week uh, that we'll talk about here in a little bit on this episode, but we will not be on live at Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific. It won't be a live episode. Uh, instead, it will be something that we post up there after, um, after the fact, but it will be posted next week. So stay tuned for that. <clears throat> and this is where we answer all the questions you submit at trainerroad.com slash podcast. Thank you for doing that. Keep doing that. It's awesome. We get so many questions from all of you, and we come through them and then address the questions or topics that we see represented or that represent a lot of the questions every week. A quick update, though, on a few things for you. We haven't talked to you since your first race of the season, right, on the podcast? Yeah. <clears throat> so <laughs> first race of the season, I was in that same race with you. Uh, how'd it go? Ooh, okay. So we're doing the analysis tomorrow. We've got videos, but uh, it was Cal Aggie, like one little chicane. Your videos are up there already for the Cap 3 yep. and Cap 3 4, yep. which you did very well in. Mm -hmm. uh, but e Iman Lucas, how you say his name? Yeah, Iman Lucas. Yeah. So that threw a whole huge wrench in it. So he's like a... People have to follow him on Instagram. He's quite the follow. E-A-M-O-N. Really? Lucas. I say, yeah, I Iman. would say Eamon. Yeah, it's Iman. Okay, yeah. Iman. Correct. So uh, he is a pro living in Belgium who's like the same size as me. But when you hear that, it means he's better at everything that I'm good at, <laughs> but like much better. So I was thinking man, this guy gets in a breakaway, he is gone, right? Yeah. But power in the peloton, as uh, Amber says it, he was all by himself. And Mike's Bikes also knew who he was. And Mike's Bikes was deep. Very strong team. So deep. Uh, Chris Reichert, he <laughs> he was there too. So Chris is, this is insane. This is how strong NorCal P12 racing is. He did that day a VO2 max and uh, threshold test. And his VO2 max was 78. Which is high. To give you an example, uh, Tour de France people are between like 70 and 80. And if you are above 80, usually in uh, you can usually win the tour. Those are like the legendary VO2 figures that we hear. <laughs> His yeah. FTP is was 395 with blood lactate, right? Yeah. And then uh, this was at a university that this was tested at. So we, I'm going to trust all the equipment. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's really fast too. Yes. And his weight is between 150 and 155. Yeah. So uh, NorCal crazy. Cycling, they, I think they videoed it, and they're going to do a video on the channel soon of, like, this test. But yeah. So that's just one hitter on the team, right? Yes, <laughs> and it's one. a whole team of hitters. <laughs> so their, their plan was to attack, like, counterattack him and get mm -hmm. him tired. So me going with him or, or chase him down was the worst idea. And then, <laughs> but, but you did it. <laughs> yeah. It felt good, though. I could go with him, yeah. which was pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple, and I actually can attest to that. You like, uh, whereas all of us, you know, when attacks go, Chad, and a little bit of distance opens up, you might close it up, but a little bit of distance opens up initially, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you kind of know, like, okay, that person's struggling to hold that wheel, something like that, or they're trying to smooth it out. Yeah. Nate, on the other hand, when it went, there was zero distance Real change. Quick. It was like he was just right with them. So yeah, I could have done a little better job, but <laughs> that guy's strong. Yes, he So is. anyways, that was a very dumb idea from what for me to do. And then the, the last part, which is just... So, so dumb. <laughs> we know about this. Cliff Bar said it before. But so I went with him and then we got caught and uh, Riker countered. Yep. Because their then, plan was just, you can see that on, on Jeff's video, their plan was to one, two, yeah. uh, Iman to basically nullify his ability to be able sure. to. To get him tired at the end. Uh -huh. So Mike Spikes countered. And then Iman goes, that's the break. That's the break. I'm not going to chase. That's the break. Go now. So and then someone listened. next to me. <laughs> so you listen to him, I of course. Why, why would I? He's a pro. He, like, right? Lives in Europe. Sure. He's uh, perfectly Especially honest. of all the countries. Like, Belgium makes me think uh, Yeah, he he's going to be fast on the flats. Yeah, he rides for the Shifting Gears Kermes racing team. They're, 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 you know, it's, like a, it's not one that you'll see racing in, like, pro tour races, but he's fast. And very, it's a fast team. Very fast. With fast people. Anyway, so someone else went at the same time, and I could get on their wheel. So I did that. 
got onto the breakaway. I thought it was the other people too thought that was the break. Mm -hmm. uh, Riker was pushing it, and I then, was praying it was so then it would stop, like the barrage would stop, <laughs> so the pain would dwindle <laughs> yeah. a bit. Yeah, I got on that, and then uh, whew, my I, I think I jumped on it when my heart rate was like 190 or something. Anyways, I had just gone really hard, very dumb to go hard again. Uh, I started to get this thing where I like. Uh, I get like exercise induced asthma. It hasn't happened since like a triathlon at Pyramid Lake in a yeah. 5K. But where if anyone's had that before, what happens is you just can't like breathe in as deep and it feels like you can't like take deep breaths. Can we actually do like a, a poll of sorts for all of those that are joining us live on YouTube right now? Let us know if you've experienced something like this and, and obviously not like a regular asthmatic, but you like it because I haven't experienced this basically ever except for two years ago at a random summer crit. Hmm. Felt it. And once again, it was like a coffee straw. It was like yeah. everything was reduced to just breathing through that. Just couldn't breathe. And I have um, al albuterol. I guess how you say it. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, a, like an inhaler. And I would usually do that before races. Mm -hmm. it hadn't happened for so long. I didn't bring it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty dumb too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyways, so I got kicked out of that break. And normally, like I would have been kicked out anyways, probably ten minutes later or five minutes later. Yeah. But I, I couldn't recover, and I couldn't even jump back onto the peloton. So yeah. I DNF'd. Yep. Sat on the side of the race and watch the finish. We've got more racing coming up this sad. weekend, which we'll have more race analysis from that. But also, you're going to be down under soon in Australia. Oh, yeah. Well, before we get that, uh, <laughs> yeah. you did. I did mountain bike race, and you analyzed it. Yes, and that comes out. It's coming out tomorrow, soon. Tucker. Yep. Maybe. Yeah, that's yeah. the plan tomorrow, so, which is pretty cool. It's going to be great. So we we broke down the first ten minutes and basically like how to attack the start of a mountain bike race because. <laughs> There's one side of it where you think, like, I just need to pedal as hard as I can, but we go into all the nuances of, of everything from the mindset to all the small little things that you do to try to get around people and always be moving forward instead of just, like, pedal as hard as you can. Because yeah. that's even unless you have a perfectly clear track, that's even then, that's still not the best strategy. Like, sure. you know, you have to place, you have to be efficient with it. So, but yeah, it's a good video. But definitely tune into that. Cyclocross, crit racing, everything. I think every bike riding genre will benefit from seeing that because it's really the keys are about efficiency and stuff and again i have a lot to learn on that one, <laughs> which is nice though yeah, you yeah a lot of, it just means you can improve a lot keeps it yep. interesting yeah so uh, you're headed to australia yep i'll we'll be that? in sydney and uh one of uh our wonderful users set up a like a a, a group ride mm -hmm. it's on march 8th uh i think we're gonna leave at nine yeah it says 9 a.m um we'll put a link in the show notes mm -hmm. it's gonna leave at boreal Boreali Road Shop, something like that. Um, and it's going to be somewhere between 40 and 80 miles. We don't, cool. I'm not sure. And then we're going to have fun afterwards. Nice. Yep. And that's that's going to be in Sydney, Australia, for the, for all those. that. Uh, yeah. So definitely, if you're local here, not going to happen. <laughs> and around that, too, I'm going to do the Saturday morning Heffron Park crit. Sweet. And the Tuesday evening Heffron Park crit, too. And if, they're going on. And if you want to find those links, you can just look for episode 244 in the Trainer Road Forum. That's forum.trainerroad.com. You'll be able to find the links to everything that we discuss here. Tucker will put them in, and you'll be able to find everything. And uh, it will be a no-drop ride. Cool. Uh, if anything, recollecting sort of a ride. Like, the goal is not to be a hammer fest, right? Please, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I just picture everyone attacking me. Look how strong I am. Yes. I know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Most of we you are strong, this. are faster than me, so... Yeah. <laughs> No worries. Yeah. Uh, cool. So uh, also one other thing, you took a ramp test because you've had a pretty – or how would you rank – you've had a block of training. Oh, yeah. What, do you th feel like it's been a consistent block of training? How would you grade I had a four-week block of training. Um, I, I, what a, I had a, uh, one trip inside of it, so not the best. But uh, I got a – what a – what was it? Four-watt increase? Four-watt increase. Yes. So 338 to 342. Um, I put that on my social stuff. And, uh, well, there's two things. One, I switched power meters. Mm -hmm. So my real block increase was pretty big. But, yeah. um, it was like 365 or something like yeah. 360, something crazy. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I'm on this new power meter. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's your now single source of truth. Exactly. So let's say out of four. I and mean, this is the point is someone was like only a four watt increase. Like, come on now, man, for, if you do a four walk increase every month for 10 months, <laughs> 40 watts. 40 watts. I'll like, take it. <laughs> like, people, you should be happy about this. Even, like, if you're a high-level rider and you're getting two every, like, four uh, four weeks, yeah. that's pretty awesome. And, two, there's another thing. Um, there's accuracy and precision. Mm -hmm. And people get that confused. So, accuracy, this is what this is what power meter companies have explained it to me because I had the same question. Mm -hmm. Precision is, like, when you come back, is it always, like, is it always going to be 0.5% off, but it's the same each time? Mm -hmm. And accuracy is how close it is to absolute truth. So when a power meter company says it's 
1.5% or 1% accurate. Um, it might be plus or minus 1%, but what they tell me, as long as you do the zero offset, like the calibrate button, it's always going to be that same. It's going to be precise. Mm -hmm. So when I go four watts, it's not within the, they're like, oh, that's within the accuracy. It's, it's, uh, that's different. It's, if it's precise, you're still getting a four watt bump, but yeah. maybe I'm five watts lower than that absolute or five watts higher or somewhere in there. Sure. And that doesn't matter. Can right? I visualize the accuracy and precision thing really quick for people? Yeah. The, the way I think of it is a target, and if you have a spread of bullets that are shooting at the target, they're a tight spread, so they're all close together, but they're not toward the center. It's precision, right? Hmm. But if you have them that are tighter to the center point, that's accuracy. So, uh, so that can help you kind of visualize the difference. Illustrate, yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, so the point is, like, and and here's the deal: if I get into a specialty phase, even I might go to a point where. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see what Chad's doing. We'll get into it later on the podcast. Don't worry. But, I need to try um, it before you. Go. So if you think about this, if I go into the specialty phase and I took an FTP test and I, my, my FTP didn't change, even though usually it's not scheduled during the specialty phase, mm -hmm. but if it didn't change at all, that's still a win, right? Like that's the thing like that, that people – I think misunderstand sometimes is we look around and whether it be on social media or just talking to other cyclists, we hear 20 watt increase, 30 watt increase, whatever it is. Yeah. And sometimes it's really easy for us to get caught up in the fact that like, man, I just saw a two watt increase or I stayed the same. Yeah. We're and, not always chasing FTP gains. Mm -hmm. yeah. You get a repeatability. Yes. And that's huge. If you're in a crit specialty and oh, you yeah. can repeat two extra yeah. times that like for me, that's the race. That's the race that winning one difference. extra time, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, cool. Uh, kind of along those lines too, yeah. uh, when you're, we're talking about, you know, improvements and workouts and checking those boxes and getting them done. Uh, one of the most common questions that we get in one regard or another is people, people talking about like, Hey, like I failed my workout and it was, you know, and, and we talk about the different things. <laughs> nice. There we go. We talk about the different things that you can do to be able to kind of like make it through the workout talk about reducing the intensity. We also talk about quick back pedals right in the middle of a longer interval if that's difficult. <laughs> we also, <laughs> people it's should really join well. us on YouTube. <laughs> it's not going well. Uh, and then we also talk about the skipping an interval if you need, taking a little bit of rest, extending a break, something like that. Mm -hmm. All in the interest of preserving interval quality or workout quality. Yeah. Yep, because so, workout <clears throat> failures happen. Like it's 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 yeah. not, if you fail the workout, don't feel like something has gone completely wrong. I want to, we should almost call it like, I don't know, workout struggles rather than failures. Because so I posted this on Strava, and a bunch of people um, were like, wow, uh, I can't, this is a workout where I, it was VO2 max intervals, and in the middle of them, um, I started taking a three minute interval. I took a 15 minute, second, 15 minute, 15 second back pedal mm -hmm. and able to finish the interval where before I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And at the very end, like the last one, I think I did two, or, um, and then I like, it was trashed, right? Mm -hmm. And it got me there. And I was like, this is a good thing. If you never, yep. if you're in build and specialty and you never, ever, ever struggle like that, like we're trying to push you against your limits. And if you don't find your limits, like that's what I'm doing. And that means I'm in the right spot. Right. Yep. And it's very, very, uh, so it's, it's awesome when you're there and Chad, correct me if I'm wrong, but back pedals in some of these intervals, like doesn't like you get a lot of the same benefit. Yeah. They, they often enough heighten the productivity of the interval. I mean, mm -hmm. just, just a quick break is in op or is, is the alternative to like full on interval failure. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't, if you're, you're doing a three minute interval and you make it to two minutes and, and you need a quick 15 second back pedal to get through the remaining 45 seconds. That's two minutes and 45 seconds of quality. What happened during that 15 seconds isn't going to come a great detriment to, to what we are intent or what I'm intending with that interval. So it keeps you on course in the alternative in that case would have been just a slow decline from proper Watts down to, you know, garbage Watts, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. And then you still have the rest of your workout to try to get through with legs that probably aren't up to the task because you just buried yourself too deeply. Yeah, and every workout doesn't have to be one. We talked about this just like, I think it was last week or the week before, but every workout shouldn't be like you're being drugged down to your bitter end every single workout. No, it's, just, it's, it's arguable that that's ever really that beneficial. Right, but occasionally you'll have workouts that do take you there. And as a coach, that's what you want to see. You want to see that you're you're basically stretching the limits of your athlete, finding them and finding where those barriers are. Like So, mm -hmm. so it needs to happen. And sometimes the like your success on a workout gets tied to like your feelings for that day. Yes. And some of these two that are the very, really hard ones that are pushing you, like you have to be, Jonathan's doing it now. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I the, forgot about this. Uh, oh, yeah. Train a road coaster. 
Or, <laughs> Sorry, threw <laughs> <laughs> you off. <laughs> um, is like you have to fire a hundred percent to do them. Yes. And just little things during the day, like your uh, your your sleep the night before, your stress, your eating, your uh, your eating before the workout, your eating the night before. Mm -hmm. um, how what your workouts were before that, um, your mm -hmm. mood, how much this intimidates you, how motivated you are, right? Yeah. All of these things change, and that can make like that one or two percent difference that that changes it. So, um, and you're not going to fire a hundred percent every day. Amber just said this in one of our meetings. It was great. Uh, you give a hundred percent, even if you're at eighty percent that day, you give a hundred percent of that eighty percent. Yeah, yep. yeah, right. Exactly. Is yeah. that right? So, <clears throat> yeah. and like, just do that. So I, some people too might be asking, well, why don't you test VO2? Like, why don't we just do VO2 intervals and then we never have a failure? Um, that's not the case because, w well, first, when you test VO2, like we used to do this with a 20 minute and eight minute test, you have to know your result before you test it because or else your pacing won't be right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then you get a, a bad number. Yep. So why do it that way? That yeah. doesn't make sense if you already know it. Two, uh, a lot of this has to do with repeatability. And repeatability is not like found out inside of a test. So, and that's what we're kind of growing in here too. Mm -hmm. So if we maybe you do the first three just right, and the last three you're starting to backpedal. But after a while, you can do you can do more and more. Mm -hmm. And repeatability is like very very important. And that's the way you find that out is by doing the workouts. Yes, um, that's, that's based off of what you do. The workout is the test. Yes, right. <laughs> so like what you can, and that's what Coggins says too. What you can do uh, repeatedly in interval or in workouts is like the best way to show how you're working out it's testing is training training is testing mm -hmm. exactly yeah exactly yeah um so it's it's not uh it doesn't get you any farther ahead than where we're at now yep and then it uh like why go through all that stress yeah and like yeah miss a workout um yeah at some point it becomes unproductive yeah, that's, that's, exactly. It's really that simple. Yeah, so so when you find yourself in a situation where your workouts are, where, where you have failed a workout, don't think that, first of all, don't think that that's like you failed the training plan. I see that a lot of the time. People kind of just give up hope in general. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, man, I'm done. I'm off the rails. It's not the case. You're going to have hard days. You're going to have difficult days. Mm -hmm. A certain type of workout might feel difficult. Wait till next week when you do that same type of workout again. You may surprise yourself. You may be better at it. Yeah, there, there are degrees of success. I, I struggle with the term failure because, mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to get something out of the workout. It's not going to be a complete failure. There's always something that comes of it. Yeah, from the coaching perspective, like any bit of work spent in that specific zone that you want them to, that's all productive. Mm -hmm. That's all moving Getting on the, the bike goal. is its own little <laughs> small form of success. Yeah. So anyways, just the back <laughs> pedals are awesome. So two with bailout levels, we talk about back pedals in intense workouts or even any workouts. If you're doing sweet spot rather than turning it down, you do backpedal for it's a 20 minute interval for mm -hmm. 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah, that can be enough. And a lot of these are built into our workouts, which is funny because if it's built in the workout, you're like, I did it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah right. exactly. <laughs> uh, so it, and then um, let's see, it's backpedal. And then it's uh, Chad, would you rather have more rest or turn it down? It depends on the type. So so when we're talking sweet spot, I, I like the little back pedals because 15 seconds goes a long way. Even if you do four 15 second uh recovery valleys over the course of a 20 minute interval, you're still getting 19 minutes of, of quality out of that mm -hmm. and perhaps better quality too, because you're not again, grinding yourself down to that, mm -hmm. that low, low point. Um, and then with VO two max, it's uh, the intervals are usually so short that it, I'd rather see, um, more time spent at a high percentage. So just toning it down two or 3% can go a real, a real long ways. Cool. Yep. Uh, one last bit of item or one last item to cover for you, dirty Kanza. Yeah, you DK. entered. You entered for DK. Okay, the so lottery. Here's here's the order of things. <laughs> I'm, just I'm just waiting till I start. Probably. <laughs> I only do it when you talk. Here are the here's the order. Uh, entered in the lottery. They put a whole bunch of lottery emails out. I didn't get an email. Then I found out that my daughter's third grade end of year camping trip. They go like these two. <laughs> these this two day camping trip um it's a big deal she's at her school she's been thinking about it since she's like three she's talking to me about it i try to be a chaperone but it's the same weekend as dk dk's there next year my daughter's never going to have this third day camping trip in her life yeah not yeah exactly yeah, yeah. priorities, priorities. <laughs> but hey so this is the, <laughs> this camping trip the hard part is Buy me a beer. they haven't <laughs> Sorry, off the rails. Sorry, continue. They, it's the opposite day, right? Yeah, it's the opposite day. Um, they haven't picked. Uh, they they haven't picked the parents yet, 
Oh, and it's like I could I'd just be a lottery into this too. <laughs> and it's, it's like a camping trip you could lottery. get denied twice. <laughs> it's it's highly uh, it's highly competitive, right? So because yeah. all these parents want to go on it, and not many parents go. Of yeah. all the kids, you know, there's like I don't know, twenty or thirty kids and three yeah. parents or something like so that. So are you in? Do you know? I do not know. Oh, wow. So we've sent an email, but we don't know, and I don't know when I'm gonna know. Yeah. And then I got my uh, email from Dirty Kanza. Just a few days after that, and I got denied too. Yep. So here's uh, it's just which, which, by the way, on the denial thing, uh, Tucker, we need to put the GIF that one of our designers, Shane, yeah. built. Uh, kudos, Shane, way to go! Uh, but an awesome GIF for Nate it's on the Kanza thing. But uh, <laughs> ooh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> start when, that war. <laughs> when um, I posted on Instagram, I don't think people watched the whole GIF because I got a lot <laughs> of like claps and like yeah. woohoo. Yeah, like, they didn't watch the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, or don't remember that scene from Wayne's World. Yeah. So. Uh, Anyways, here's what might happen. If I don't get into camping, I am going to use my connections to get um, – there's one thing I don't want to do. I don't want to take a slot from someone away who like well, like For a regular sure. person. Yeah. But sometimes they have media slots. I'm totally fine taking away like a media person. Like <laughs> sure. another person in the industry, we're all big people. We're going to be like, covering this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, um, yeah. Or if there's like a charity slot where I can pay – I don't know. I don't even know. They probably don't do this, but – Sometimes Iron Man do this where you pay like extra money. All the money goes to charity. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do it if there's one of those available. Um, but I just wouldn't want to kick anybody out. Like of, of I mean, course, that right. wouldn't happen too. They would yeah, be like, yeah. yeah. No. So if they if there is a way for me to get in through connections or like a media like already slots, some companies have extra slots too. Yeah. Um, if we get that through a partnership, that'd be awesome. But I might be doing like a three weeks to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, <laughs> let's cram. <laughs> yeah, cram for a 200 mile. Can we cover Backward. one very exciting bit of news on the, on the same lines of that? <laughs> Playing the air guitar. Uh, your bike arrived, your Kansas bike. Mr. Hagar, Shammy Hagar. Shammy <laughs> Hagar, the evil Shammy Hagar. Yep. Uh, we covered this like the geometry. We kind of broke down the geometry on a previous episode. I think it was 242. I could be wrong, it's, Tucker. It's but, unusual. Um, it's, it's an unusual looking bike, huh, Chad? You've seen it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of we're like, talking about beer, kind of like what we're experiencing right here. It's very yeah. dissatisfying. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think it's here's it, what it is. It's just unusual. I know. I'm trying that's to wrap my is. mind around. Yeah. It's it's different. So I'm Look, trying not to judge different. it on that it's, basis. That's what it is. And when, when people see different things, and there is a certain amount of population, whenever it's different, they go. Ugh. So I because it's different than what they see. On. I shared an image of of it on Instagram. I took a picture of your bike on Instagram, and it's about as polarizing as a Tesla truck. Over 200 throw up emojis. Like people are, they just do not like this bike, right? But I, so Grant, it does not fit me whatsoever. It does have a dropper post, so I was at least able to get the saddle height. But it's a, it's a very, I would get a smaller frame, right? So, asterisk number one, other gigantic asterisk. This is a parking lot test. I mean, just riding around yeah. the parking lots. This is not taking out on gravel or anything else. But it feels exactly like what the numbers behind it say. That it's it's like a hardtail, but more stable than a hardtail. Hmm. And once you get it up to speed, it's even more stable. At slow speed, it does feel a bit wandery, certainly compared to a gravel bike. However, it's not twitchy at all, right? It's like very smooth. Even like when you dropped off the curb, <clears throat> what I know curb? it's just a curb. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's very smooth and handles that very well. Yeah. Um, so it's, I think it's, and and just to double down on what I said before, I think it's the bike that the majority of the roadies gone grodies those sort of people that's what they need like yeah. because it, it would be better for them because if you think about it they probably lack more on the skill side compared to some sort of mountain biker right they're coming at it from that end mm -hmm. and if they had a bike that was a bit more compliant more stable more confidence inspiring it would take less energy even that doesn't matter like uh so if you work for osha don't listen for a second <laughs> but i ride this around our office a little bit and <laughs> so if you're going like if it was single track and you had to do like tight turns and stuff not the bike for you, mm. yeah. but a gravel race. Uh, I don't see why anyone like, even if you had a lot of skills, yeah, why you wouldn't want. A yeah, bike it's the like first this. legitimate foray into finding the right tool for this particular job for the gravel job. Yeah, yep. so I, yeah, I, I, I get where they're going. I respect it, them for it. Some people Same message me. Chad. Mm -hmm. One guy was like, on Instagram, uh, "Good luck being slow." <laughs> <laughs> you got like think of them from a physics perspective. First, the the saddle position is the same that's on my road bike, right? So like the bottom bracket to saddle, and yep. they built it that way. It's the same. So so pedaling power, the same. Reach, mm -hmm. the same. Um, other than that, you're overcoming rolling resistance, uh, any flex in the, the system, which there's not, uh, aerodynamics and weight. Aerodynamics, I'm sure it's know. not. I'm sure it's not aero compared to a vent, right? 
Sure. Y- yeah. But, but all gravel bikes, like, I don't know, and the speeds are pretty low. I, I don't really know what that is. But yeah. rolling resistance... It's going to be the same. And weight is actually pretty light. Uh, I think with the dropper and stuff, it's, it's like 20 or something. Impressively light. I think actually. I can get it down to like 19 and a half, but that's an extra large too with uh, yeah, like super large tires on it and a dropper post yes. and everything. <laughs> um, so like when you put that much power, if you put the power in, so first if the if the saddle and bottom bracket is in the same position and you get in the same position road bike, you're going to be able to put out the same amount of power, mm-hmm. right? So I'm yep. put out the same amount of watts. And then other than that, there's nothing else besides maybe the arrow or the weight, but the, the weight's pretty close. And yeah. I don't know, my cross, my crux is like, um, what is a cross bike when it has everything on it with, it's like 19 and a half pounds. So the weight's not that much different. Or maybe it's 20 because I have a drop post on that too. But yeah, it's pretty much the same weight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's really arrow. It's like the only difference. I know, but I, I mean, that compared to my crux, my crux isn't knows, optimized right? for arrow. Yeah. Uh, and then who knows if the whole arrow thing is kind of blown apart once you have a big knobby tire on there and that I, who right because then yeah. that could totally change how the air flows over the whole bike. Blow is testing that right now, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I'm going to be going 14, 15, 60 miles per hour, mm-hmm. and then in a pack too. So it'll be it's, interesting. It's I think it's pretty rad. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> it's like it's definitely something that's for the eyes. It's hard to get used to because it's totally different. Oh, this is yeah. But this is what it's like. <laughs> See supermodels, like models on runways. They always have like different proportions than the standard people. Sure. But they're beautiful when you look it up there, right? (laughs) (laughs) I I get that. We're reaching. Not sure of that. No, no, we're reaching. (laughs) It's a supermodel, everyone. (laughs) It's an evil supermodel. (laughs) Should we move into the questions? A little biased, but yep. (laughs) yep. Okay, sounds good. We're like, finally. Uh, First one, we get we get a number of different questions around this topic, so we decided to address it more generally. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, whether it's asking for Chad's playlists or whether it's asking for like what sort of music that we listen to or what sort of things that we do we use in order to eat, like increase either focus or entertainment, performance, whatever it may be on the mm-hmm. bike, uh, music. Yeah, uh, so we, we've all recognized that music is beneficial to performance Life. or at least yeah, just in the in the training domain. It's really hard not to train with music or to train without music. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we came across an article that that uh, kind of piqued our interest, looked into it, didn't really have legs, not in terms of what we're most concerned with. So mm-hmm. uh, cast it aside and did a bit of digging and found uh, a review that does a really good job of summarizing everything that actually does make a difference in, in this realm, in the performance-oriented realm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, it's titled music in the exercise domain, a review and synthesis. And the authors are Karagoris and priest. It's back from 2011. And it seems like it might be a little bit old, but the one prior to it was 1997. Mm -hmm. And all those studies were of, uh, as they put it, variable quality equivocal findings. So it didn't really have a lot to go on. Now we do. Um, it's a two part review. Uh, we'll, we'll link to both of those parts, but the nutshell, I'll just, I'll just, you know, cut to the chase and then go into some details is that music can indeed exert beneficial psychological and ergogenic effects during exercise. You know, news to nobody. We, we know this anyway, but it's nice to have a little bit of science behind it and take a look at, you know, why those th- why that may actually be. Is it just in our heads? Is there something more to it? Yeah, it's in our heads. <laughs> it, it, it very much is. It is. Nice Part dad joke. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Additionally. Yeah, yeah. So um, these guys looked at, I mean, it's a review, so I think it was like 27 studies. It's a it's a lot of studies, and, and, and they all had to qualify with certain criteria. You know, they had to have, you know, certain pool sizes. Uh, the ways they measured it, although with something like this, is that can be a bit difficult. I'll get to that too. Um, but they looked at four measurable effects: uh, the ergogenic effects, which is you know basically does it delay fatigue or and or increase work capacity. Mm-hmm. The psychological um, effects: effect on mood, emotion, feelings of pleasure, cognition, and behavior. And then the psychophysical effects, which are basically the effect on perception of effort and fatigue. And then finally, the psychophysiological, which is effects on things like heart rate and blood pressure. Of those four, I really feel it's most relevant to us to look into the ergogenic effects and the psychophysical effects. So I limited mm. um, my notes to that. Although if this is interesting to you in any way, go check it out because huge document, lots of interesting studies, lots of interesting findings. The physiological one too, with effects on mood. You ever oh, in yeah. a workout and then that killer song comes oh, on? Yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't I mean, underplay yeah. the benefits of the psychological yeah. boost you get. Instantly, yeah. the watts like feel like it's less. It's yeah. ridiculous. Like I'm on top of yeah. it now. I yeah, and, and some of the, I mean, the psychophysiological, which we're going to talk about, it integrates It's tied that. together, yeah. Yeah. Or actually, we're going to talk about the psychophysical. But in any case, there's a psycho element of it. Yeah, I find that many times, actually, 
I've even skipped songs because I know it's so good and it's like the song that I need. That. Uh, and I find that I'm like, I'm going to yep. blow my power targets here. <laughs> like I'm going to go too hard, you know, because I don't train with erg mode. So yeah, I'm just yeah. riding on the rollers. And I find a lot of the time, like when the song comes on and I'm going, well, I'm like, I'm 30 watts over. I need to calm down, <laughs> like get back in it, you know? So yeah. Must be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that happens a lot. <laughs> it doesn't. Okay. So first the psychophysical effects, and this is basically how we perceive effort and fatigue. Okay. So across studies, there seemed to be agreement on about a 10% reduction at low to moderate effort levels. So when we're not doing a ton of work, and I feel like this would go all the way up to maybe sweet spot sort of work. Um, <clears throat> the problem is, is measuring this is, is well, it's problematic. They, they would like to use, or we would like to have scientists use, researchers use uh, fMRI, so functional magnetic resonating, EEGs, uh, respiratory analysis, all these things make it really difficult for people to focus on what they're trying to measure, which is the benefit of the music. <laughs> so they can't, they have to go about it in different ways. And all these studies do, and I won't delve into that. That's again, information that you can seek out if you want to. Can I just add one bit to that? Sure. Like we've, we've experienced that. We've <clears throat> talked about that even doing a VO2 test. It's pretty hard doing a VO2 oh, test with no, that, no, with uh, all the mm -hmm. equipment that you've got going on. Any sort of additional process or anything else like that really does. Yeah. yeah. So it'd be hard to, hard to measure that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, so back to psychophysical, the, the no significant reduction in RPE beyond <clears throat> when we get to like a, what they refer to as anaerobic threshold, what we call FTP. So once you start working that hard, the, 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 the RPE changes don't really come into play. Um, and they attribute this to, to the due or due to a command of afferent feedback. So when you think of all the information that comes from the environment and feeds into your central nervous system, that's what we're talking about here. And really they liken it to like a limited internet bandwidth. We can only process so much information. And we've talked about cognitive load often, and it's the same, it's, it's along those same lines. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, is that intensity determines the extent that music can inhibit processing of other sensations. We can only deal with so much input. And if we're already wrestling with trying to hang in onto a very difficult interval, the music doesn't really have as much of an effect as it would at lower, to, lower and moderate intensity levels. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So at those lower levels, we can actually, we have the capacity to share our, our cognitive processing power, right? Higher intensity, not so much because the physiological goings on kind of dominate our attention, they take full charge of it. However, <clears throat> excuse me, um, music, is, it can't alter our perception of fatigue, but it can change how we interpret or respond to that. So, so these sensations are coming in. We decide how we feel about them. It basically helps us manage the pain and the discomfort that comes with training and racing also. Um, so uh, I've talked many times about productive distraction within the intervals. I see this more as productive interpretation. The information is coming in. We decide how to feel about it. We can decide to make it a bad thing, a negative thing, or a positive thing. Um, so, so really we're just reframing exercise stress, um, because we, we understand what we get out of the workout. So it keeps us hanging in there because we know there will be a reward. Mm -hmm. So we decide to interpret the, the sensations differently. Um, some interesting notes, uh, along the lines of the psychophysical effects is that, um, preferred music versus non-preferred music in high intensity, um, it, they reported, uh, lower RPE. Mm -hmm. So. When once the once the intensity starts to ramp up, it does kind of matter if you like the music or not, if you chose the music or not. And we've all seen evidence of that. Skip that song. Yeah, like, totally. Totally. You go yeah. to someone's class where they're picking the music for you and you're not feeling it. Yes. It becomes of more consequence during the higher intensity work. Mm -hmm. um, low, to matter, uh, low to moderate intensity levels didn't really seem to matter. So whether they chose the music or not, people were just kind of okay with it. Didn't really affect their um, sensations or their perceived effort and fatigue. I have a question. So at the high intensity... <clears throat> Music good or no good? Good. Good. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But so, so there was, there was, um, lower ratings of perceived exertion because the music was their preferred, preferred. music. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But before we said that it, there was no benefit for high intensity because your cognitive load, I, I don't get how those two, am I, I mean, I not no, but less. Okay. So may I, may I phrase that and, mm -hmm. and we've got to remember, we're looking at 27, seven different studies here. So what one study says, another study may contradict to some extent. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty easy to test yourself. Like I you mean, it absolutely one. is. And, and yeah. all this we've all done, whether we recognize it or not, we've kind of run these self experiments and mm -hmm. we find the stuff that works the best for us. And we glom onto that or the particular song. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as far as the ergogenic or the performance enhancing end of things, um, now we're looking at increases in actual work capacity and delayed delays in fatigue. So 
Um, and, and they broke this down, uh, or a number of the studies broke it down into pre-task, in-task, and post-task. So we're talking prior to the workout, during, and after. Um, so preferred music prior to the workout can heighten self-confidence. So there's a, a true psychological boost right there. Every high school football team <laughs> in the country, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, any, yeah, good yeah example. exactly. Yeah. Um, all out, uh, one study did all-out sprints on a stationary bike. Um, and then for 20 minutes prior, they used slow or fast tempo music. And it had no ergogenic effect. They didn't perform any better, but it elevated their heart rate and their adrenaline or epinephrine levels, which indicates an increase in arousal. So they were a little more primed for the work. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I just see this as both ment mental and physical prep. This, you know, why not? Why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. um, as far as in task, they differentiated between high intensity and once again, low to moderate intensity. With the high intensity, different findings, different different requirements, because again, the cognitive load is so high. Um, the lyrical content can actually enhance the effect of music on performance. So if you're hearing positive aff affirmations and task-related cues, you know, go harder, hang in there, suffer. I mean, there's like, geez, what is it, a dead dropping? I can't think of the name, but you hear it all the time and it's, it kind of repeats this chant that's, that really kind of hits home, especially when you're when you're hurting. And there are a lot of songs that do that exact thing. Sophia has talked about this. She yeah. listens to Cardi B. Cardi B, yeah. Because like, yeah. Cardi B takes <laughs> no, it is. Um, anything from anyone. Yes. <laughs> and she was, yeah, and it's kind of along the same lines. Like she was like, yeah, I don't usually listen to it, but then when I'm like warming up and I've noticed the same thing, like when I'm training, I'll listen to like electronic music and stuff that's like, and if you listen to those lyrics, they're so ridiculous. Because like a lot of the time, it's just like the yeah. same thing repeated. But when you're talking about something when you're coming like before performance or anything like that, and it's like a high intensity performance, those silly lyrics that are like aspirational and probably over the top, mm -hmm. suddenly are not over they, the top. They resonate a bit. They resonate, yeah. right? So yep. it, yeah, it, I've definitely felt that before. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And science bears it out, or at least one, one study did. Yep. Um, so those habituated to acute intensity. So the people who are used to doing high intensity training are less likely to use dissociative strategies and veered more toward o associative. So if you've heard that, it's, it's kind of an old adage about um, competitive athletes focus on the sensations, whereas non-competitive avoid it. Mm -hmm. You know, they try to think about anything but. But mm -hmm. again, we've recognized yes. the benefit of it. So we think about, we, we really focus on getting it right and making ourselves hurt because we recognize that that hurt will be productive. That's in, that's interesting. That's like, because a lot of the time I try to explain like the difference between like who uses trainer road and who doesn't yeah. among cyclists. And that's like yeah. one key thing right there I haven't thought of before. It's like a person that doesn't try to distract and run away from the discomfort, but understands the discomforts productively. Like yep, this said. is how I describe like, uh, I don't care what I say, but like a Zoom, a Zoom class, like you're trying to make it so you don't know you're working out. <clears throat> yes. Right. Exactly. And there's a whole set of the population that works really well. Yeah. But the effect, a workout is not as effective. Our people, like it's hard work. They yeah. don't want to be. They don't want to be distracted and, and fooled. Like they, to, yeah, to, they, to work they this do, hard, you can't. They, they want to do exactly. Focused. When you're getting to this level, you have to just focus on the work mm -hmm. and be inside of the work, not like yeah. doing. And because on race day, you're going to experience that very same thing. And yeah. like, where's the facade then? Like it's stripped away, right? Yeah. So you have yeah. to be able to, to, to face it head on like Strong that. Strong point, yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, as far as the tempo, slow and fast pop music, um, both elicited superior performances when it came to the max intensity type of work. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the, the, this showed us that it's less about tempo, more about personal motivation. Mm -hmm. Um, then there's the effective, effectiveness of segmentation. So think of uh, like songs that build momentum, um, intervals mm -hmm. that hit when the intensity of the interval and anything that coincides. And it's for this reason that I used to create soundtracks for my bike classes that were very specific. And mm -hmm. sometimes I would even shape the workouts around a song, which was a heck of a lot easier. Um, and and the, the, the gist here is that anticipation heightens the effort when it matters. I mean, just knowing, I mean, like a drum roll into just a part of a song that really works for you and just knowing that it's coming starts to build anticipation. You start to commit a little more and you get a heck of a lot more out of the, the following work effort. Um, Can I share my, one of my favorite songs for that? For the dumb step? Sure. No, <laughs> it's Rage Against the Machine. Oh Sleep yeah. Sleep Now yeah, on the Fire. Exactly. That the, song. 
I use the heck out builds, of those guys. Builds, builds, builds. Oh, my classes. gosh. Oh, They've yeah, got yeah. A, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. super good at that. Yeah. It's one of the best ones for building for me. Um, and then <clears throat> this was interesting, too. Uh, slow to faster <laughs> tempos led to okay, higher work rates. <laughs> hey, hush now. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> slow to faster tempos led to higher work rates than purely slow or fast tempi, which mm. uh, I love all these fun plurals. Um, <laughs> so, so rather than a song that stays slow or rather than a song that stays fast, it was these changes in tempo actually enhance motivation and increase work output. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so what this shows us, uh, and this this was especially uh, prevalent when levels plateaued during later stages of an exercise. So, I mean, you kind of get numb to it at some point. You kind of lose track of if the song just sounds consistently the same. You're doing high intensity work. You need that variety. Or th these guys report that or report that you do benefit from that variety. Mm -hmm. Just changes in tempo are enough to keep us physically or uh, psychologically engaged. And then when it comes to low to moderate intensity, um, the, the majority of the studies linked clear improvements in endurance performance across the board. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, disagreement there. They did find an ideal BPM seemed to be in the like 125 to 140 range. That's BPM of beats per minute. Yeah, beats per minute. Music. Yeah, not, so even yeah. though you're not pedaling that fast, and this, this uh, is a point I didn't really touch on, but there's uh, this uh, disconnect between the, the beat of the music and uh, – in our case, it'd be RPM. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to follow it to actually benefit from particular beats. In this case, 125 to 140 seem to be workable for most hard uh, to across find. these studies. <laughs> hard to find really exciting music at like 90 BPM, so, you know, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah it kind of get that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I and mean, then familiar views, music versus non-familiar music when it came to low-moderate intensity stuff, again, no significant effects. It's like people cared less. It's just They just wanted music. Um, and music did show a capability in lowering heart rate, blood pressure, and perceived exertion. And I think this is what they attribute the increases in efficiency. It's like, how can you possibly get more efficient by listening to a song? Well, if it brings your heart rate down, brings your blood pressure down, you're, you're doing the same amount of work for less physiological stress. So an increase in efficiency. And then uh, music's ability to lessen perceived exertion can have a pronounced effect on the program's success. And, and what are we all about but adherence? We want people to do every workout. We want them to do each workout as successfully as possible. And if music can enhance that possible or increase that possibility, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. And then really briefly, when it came to post-task, um, they showed that sedative music correlated with lower cortisol levels in one study about five minutes after the workout, which means music can decrease arousal too, which post-workout can be a very good thing, especially if you're working out later in the day. Mm -hmm. And then again, I'll reiterate, there are a whole lot more findings in both parts of these. We, we linked to them and there's the, 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 both those papers are rife with information. So if you have an interest in learning more about this, um, check it out because there's lots in there. This is something that I do, and let me know if there's any science back this, but sure. turning the music off during the rest period. Yep. Because then you get that change in tempo, right? Yeah. You don't get otherwise you get desensitized. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, it touched on that as well. And that's something that we can absolutely relate to. Because if you just bomb yourself with music the whole time, even during those recovery valleys where you're trying to get away from the stress and trying to mentally reset, it can be pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, can I ask a couple practical practical questions about what we do for music when we ride? Sure. Uh, so, uh, firstly, we'll just talk indoors here. Um, what headphones do all of you use? Well, I've switched. This mm. is, um, I really like these now, the Apple AirPod Pros. Okay. Uh, Air, isn't that right? Yeah. I think that's what they're, yeah. Yeah, AirPod Pros. More isolating. Mm. Because, yeah, they're, uh, the noise canceling works well. And other noise canceling ones, when the fan hits me, like this, the wind yeah. was like super loud. Yeah. But these don't have that. Nice. So I can't hear my drivetrain while I'm working out, which yeah. is pretty cool. Awesome. Um, and I've switched to the Al AirPods, the regular AirPods, when I forget the AirPod Pros. And because uh, I had those two, and they're not as good, so the, mm. that's what I like. Yeah. Cool. I still use the Shure eBuds. It's S C H U R E, uh -huh. because they have the only fitting that really nests in my ear canal. So, so the the shape of the earpod or not earpod, the earbud, and then the little fittings that go on it. They've been the only brand that consistently closes out all the exterior sound well enough that I can keep it at re reasonably low volumes and still. Yep. feel moved by the music they're, and then i they have they came out with some wireless ones too that i'm experimenting with right now and I'm, they're promising same design yeah yeah eh, close okay. the, the fitting that goes into the canal is similar but okay. then of course it's got the big old bulbous thing that has to sit 
in here, but it's so far so good. It's, it's closing out the exterior sound pretty well. So those are the best headphones I've used for isolating outside noise yeah. like that without any sort of like noise cancellation. Uh, this yep. is just passive. Same. Um, they're really good for that. And Jaybird for a while made wireless ones that yeah. were shaped just like that. And they worked really well. I have those and I like them. <laughs> and then they ended up, and they don't sound as good as the Shures, they but, but they, they ended up like frying and then... I, they didn't make them anymore, which really stunk. So mm. I have their um, Jaybird Run XT, and I don't love them. I always have to adjust them because they're too big for my ear, and they're mm. just wireless buds, just kind of like the AirPods, but they fully seal out sound or are supposed to. It's a they, lot of trial and error to find ones that are yeah, just right. But they have some new ones. I, I do not like ones that have any sort of band that goes on my neck, mm. sort of bridging between the two, because I always find that that ends up because when I'm training them, moving my head and neck around and I end up, it ends up like pulling slightly because I get sweaty and, and it grips. So I like fully wireless earbuds for sure. Um, I'm going to try the new Jaybird. I, they have a new one. I can't remember. Vista, I think it's called, is the new one I'm going to try. I think Tucker's going to put the link in for those. Uh, I've heard that they go into the ears better. So uh, if anybody else has ones that isolate really well, like AirPod Pros or anything else like that, um, uh, you should share them. Go to forum.trainerroad.com to episode 244. Also, when I'm outside... I don't, uh, the only time I will use music is if I am on a gravel ride on roads where nobody else is there. And I only use one AirPod <clears throat> or one little, little guy. And that's just because for me, the safety aspect, especially on trails, I don't like using headphones on trails just because I want to make sure I hear everything. And when you're talking about anything with variable surface, like hearing is your warning system to traction, right? Like that's like what you hear is directly tied to what your tires are doing on the ground and hmm. your bike's ability to perform. So when you isolate that, you don't perform as well. One last thing I wanted to pitch and just kind of get your thoughts on Chad. I know some trainers, uh, within, especially like the enduro space, they actually don't, some coaches don't, that I know of, don't let their athletes listen to music. And they like say, don't listen to music at all oh, sure. because on race day, you won't have, cause music. they're developing a crutch. The, yes. The idea. Right. And and I personally don't agree with that because I feel like on race day, my arousal is super high. Yeah. And in order motivation to, side. And my motivation side. Absolutely. To, it just shifts. And I need that help. Yeah. And you can't conjure that. that sort of motivation inside for every workout. I mean, maybe you can get in touch with it every once in a while, but it's not going to be a consistent thing. Music, however, can be. I, I feel, would, yeah, I feel the same. I would argue that you are never motivated in training like you are in in person race. For sure. Sure. With 50 so people use around you. Whatever, so race. whatever tools at your disposal when you're working out, then why not? Yeah, because all of that is going to elevate your performance potential, like what we're talking about here. And if you perform at a higher level, that means more adaptation, right? Because that's the point of training. So, so it's it's not it's uh, and I yeah I don't see the crutch side. I feel like it evens out. I, I wish it evens out because on race day I don't need any music. I'm hyped. The only downside I can think of is if you <clears throat> blare it too loud, hurt your hearing. Sure. sure. Just make sure you yeah. don't do that. And that's why I like the ones that fit in so well because you don't yep. have to play them at very high volumes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Agreed. All right. Aaron's question says, I recently purchased a speed concept. That's a Trex TT bike. <clears throat> so a few months back for my first tri bike, the bike was used just for tri time trials by the previous owner and came with only tubular race wheels an 80 millimeter zip front wheel and zip fold disc back wheel for context. I'm 25 years old. I'm a male five foot, nine inches, very light at 130 pounds or 59 kilograms. And currently have a 221 watt FTP. I'm looking to get it to 250 watts, though, and train, or with Trainer Road before the season starts, and 2020 will be my third year in triathlon. I'm looking to break the 440 mark this year in 70.3. That's pretty fast. Nice job. That's very fast. Mm -hmm. So I've been putting in time on the trainer, but need to start thinking about getting a set of wheels I can actually ride outside with on a regular basis since I only have tubular race wheels currently. I personally like to avoid everything that goes with tubular wheels, especially my main concern of having to change the tire mid-race. I recognize these are they are less likely to flat. That's an assumption, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, and say and then he says, but want to keep the simpler, uh, want to keep things simpler, so I feel confident in my mid race repairs. I'm leaning towards selling them to buy a set of carbon clinchers that I can train on and race with. Is it worth selling these wheels to get a set of carbon clinchers so I would be more comfortable on racing on them, or should I just suck it up and stick with a tubular setup for races and get another set of training wheels? Any concerns with such a deep set of wheels for a 130-pound rider? Uh, and then finally, also, if I race on carbon wheels and train on aluminum, should I always change the brake pad in between races? Let's work backwards uh, on his questions, if that's okay. So first of all, uh, tra change the pads in between 100%. Mm -hmm. yes. oh, yeah. Every single time. And if you if you put um, aluminum pads that are made for metal wheels onto carbon wheels, they aren't going to work well at all. 
like you, you'll grab your brakes and just nothing will happen. It also can really damage your brake track. Aren't there some pads, though, that go both ways? Yes, there are. I think are. there are. Uh, Swiss Stop, I think, makes And they yeah. usually wear out extremely quickly, so that's something else you'll have to keep in mind. And carbon pads in general wear out very – they should wear out quickly. Um, they're made – they're softer, more porous because they need to grip harder on that surface. And in a lot of cases, a brake track is just smooth, whereas with some things like, for example, I think Zip, uh, they have like a very textured brake mm-hmm. track that's very aggressive. So your pads will wear down very quickly depending on how much you brake. So, But, yes, switch them out. Um, any concerns on such a deep set of wheels for a 130-pound rider? Let's say you guys. It really depends on where you're racing. Um, if I'm in, like, Kona, I wouldn't do a – I'm pretty big right now, and I wouldn't do a 808 up front at Same. Kona. Yeah, it 80 would, millimeters and heavy crosswinds yeah. is – But every other course affair. I've ever done for triathlons, and I've done, I don't know, between 30 and 50 triathlons. Mm-hmm. Everyone I would have an 808 besides Kona. Yeah. So uh, the wind, like if yeah. anybody is listening to this and doesn't, I mean, the winds, like everybody says, it's true. They are yeah. absolutely unique. And it's the gusts. If it's you're the gusts. gusts. That's exactly. We do a TT here with 40, I swear, 40 mile per hour crosswinds, but they're consistent. Yeah. You just ride like sideways. Canted. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you make, you make do. It's but, fine. Uh, yeah. When it's the gusts. That's the scary part. It's unreliable. Yeah. So, and, and, and actually kind of going into that before you can look back to, or look back to an episode that we recorded with envy. And we kind of talked about this very thing, but what really causes a bike to be truly unstable in a crosswind instead of just like canting, cause anybody can cant and that's fine. And then of course, when the wind goes away, that makes it nerve wracking. And then when it comes back, but r- what really causes your bike to be unstable, isn't necessarily the fact that the wind is pushing on you. It's that there's a pressure differential on your front wheel. Basically the point of highest pressure shifts away from the axle of your front wheel and toward the front of that wheel or toward the back even and it twists. It either way. Yep. And it causes it to twist. So that's why the front wheel is so important. Important. The back wheel really doesn't matter that much. And it's kind of interesting that they limit disc wheels for Kona, yeah. for Kona when I think that they should really limit the front wheel depth because that probably has a greater impact on on, on reducing safety. So, yeah, on making things safer. So uh, but there are wheels and and like Envy was talking about the lengths that they went to to design their deeper wheels. I think that we are talking specifically about the seven eights uh, to not perform or to balance out that pressure point on the front wheel so that there isn't a big pressure differential it's balanced and it doesn't torque your front end Mm -hmm. and i've felt that for sure because i've ridden some wheels that are like 35 deep and they perform worse in crosswinds than those seven eights that i have on my tt bike even so it's not necessarily uh, once again it's it's more about how the wheel is designed but in general you can usually assume that if the depth is going down you're going to have less effect yeah, they, I agree with you about the Envy stuff, but also the five sixes are are better in wins than the seven eights on Envy, yep. which makes sense. Less uh, depth. Yeah, exactly. Less surface area, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah so that's uh, something to, to keep uh, keep in mind. Uh, okay, so uh, to the two wheelers versus clinchers thing. Uh, <laughs> why are tubulars? Yeah. <laughs> why are seriously? Why are they still around? <laughs> yeah. I agree. Um, I, I I think that he should absolutely sell the tubulars. You got to sell those fast because, like, <laughs> especially uh, with disc brakes too. Like yes. these things, not many people are going to buy them. So yeah, uh, you need to pass that along. <laughs> yes. So like the first of all, tubulars, and like you mentioned in this case, it's difficult to to. I mean, repairing a flat. Like I've ridden with plenty of people that have tubulars and they carry around one of those spare tubes with like a quick strip that yeah. basically is like a glue strip that's on there. They peel off the lining and put it on them. They hope that that stays on because it's not really canister. glued. <clears throat> or a canister of yeah. glue. I think people it's only still do that because it looks really pro, but yes. it looks pro like 20 years ago. <laughs> I think it's, <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. tubulars are only for pro cyclocross racers with mechanics. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right, that's like the ideal setup. Yeah, if you have mechanic staff. Y- you even see like pro road teams, all the all the pro road teams are switching over. Uh, Quick Step, I think, is entirely going to be clincher this year. The NTT tubeless. team uh, that use Envy. Yeah, Tubeless as well. Yep. So NTT, I think that team with Envy, I think that they're going to be all on Tubeless. And, and here's the deal. Like, there's two sides of it. Yes, you can make a tubular. And for those that don't know, a tubular tire versus a clincher tire. We should probably just cover that really quick. But uh, a clincher tire is like the tire that you chances are you've seen on your bicycle, or it's like a car tire, basically, in the sense that it just is like a half shell, so to speak. But a tubular is a, like a complete unit where it's basically the tire, the tube inside, and then it's got a piece of fabric that's sewn to the bottom of that tire. And the tube is it's also tube. in some cases stuck to that. And then you just glue that to your rim and your rim doesn't have a deep channel. It just has like a, a kind of like a crescent dish to it. 
and you glue it to it. It's a nasty process. And then it's a multi-day process. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then after it's glued, you let them dry and then you can ride them. The reason that they flat less flatted less is because of the fact that you didn't have those deep rim channels. So it was harder to get pinch flats. Right. But these days with how they're designing rims and with the fact that we have tubeless and we have sealant, it's honestly, I would say that you actually are, are likely to flat more often on two wheelers than you are on tubeless because like these are built to have flat prevention measures now. And what happens when you get a flat on tubular? <laughs> Good luck, right? You have to no, tear the thing off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah your tire's <clears throat> gone. True. Yeah, tire's gone. You can ride oh, on yeah. it for a while. That's the one thing that it's better is you can ride on it. Yep. So that's that's the one perk. But even then, when we say ride on it, you're doing so at the expense of your wheel, not as much as doing so on a clincher, but sure. you can still totally hurt your wheel. And it's not safe to ride on. It's a flat tire. Yeah, I, I think that having the tubeless set up, like you'll seal. How many people you go back and you're like, wow, I had a flat, but it's sealed. Yes, mm -hmm. all the that time. That is much better than the benefit of being able to ride on it. Yes. Because you'll have less flats overall, I think. And also look where like the development is going in terms of engineering. Like they're going toward tubeless clincher designs and wheels designed for they're that. They're getting good. Yeah. Um, someone told me in the industry, won't name who, but they did a test with pros when they didn't know what, when they were at, and they couldn't tell the difference between mm. like new uh, tubeless clinchers and Road tubulars. Feel and rolling resistance Ex and all yeah. that. Well, rolling resistance is better. Yeah. It's actually the, better on tubeless. <laughs> yep. But uh, the, they couldn't tell the difference in the feel. Mm -hmm. But they, but that's the thing the pros are like, the feel, the feel so much feels better, the feel so much better. But when they didn't know, yeah. they couldn't tell. Yeah. Which is a lot of things, right? In, totally. Especially in cycling. Because it's so set on tradition and what yeah. we've always done, mm -hmm. so to speak. Right? Jamie Hagar, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Breaking that mold. So uh, I, I would definitely get rid of them, in my opinion. So And, and also, do your research. Uh, I can think of... Um, so this is probably a couple years old now, but Bike Radar did a fantastic test. Do you remember this? And they tested like deep TT wheels. They did a really good job of taking them into the wind tunnel, testing them at different yaw angles, showing the results instead of just saying this one's an overall winner, but showing the results at different yaw angles. Oh, yeah. And then they rode them outside and they rode them in variable conditions. And they basically said like this one, we felt way more stable or this one carried more speed for the same wattage, that mm -hmm. sort of a thing. They did a very good <clears throat> test on that. So I would check that out because that could be a good, because chances are you're probably looking at something rather deep uh, since triathlon, it just makes sense. So I would look at that because the wheels in there, they talked about which ones were unstable and which ones were very stable. So if you're worried about that being a lighter rider, especially. The other good thing, the market for non, like carbon, uh, for non, what am I going to say, non-disc wheels Yes, is pretty good, I think, for use right now because everyone's moving over yeah. to um, disc brakes. So if you're a TT or a, or a time trialist and you're okay with carbon forever, that could be a good time to buy that. For sure. Like you just got rid of the tubulars. Still not a lot of rim brake or disc brake, uh, uh, time trial or T or like tri specific bikes, relatively speaking, they're, they're rolling out. They're rolling now. out. But I mean, as they roll out more, a lot of people are going to be, uh, getting rid of their rim brake ones. So, yep. so it's not like you have to sell it yesterday, but it would be definitely easier to sell it the sooner rather than later. Kim's question. I have my first race of the season this coming weekend. It's a C event. My goal is to improve my pacing strategy and not fall prey to, to the blow up, in quotes, she says, after the first 15 minutes of hard effort, which I've been prone to in past races. I've been mountain bike racing for the last three years, five to eight races per season as an age grouper, and moved up to the sport class last season. So the sport class is equivalent to Cat 2, for those that don't know. Uh, there's And mountain biking, it's 3, 2, 1, so that's the middle category. Uh, competing with better racers has led to getting smoked by women with way better fitness and or strategy than me. That's a super common thing, right? Like top of the top of the food chain. Suddenly <laughs> it's all yeah, changed. That might be one, two race. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, on the podcast, he talk a fair amount about race strategy for road, but not as much for mountain biking. My upcoming race is a three lap, six mile course over terrain with lots of technical features, close trees, granite obstacles, and slippery routes. There are a few places to there, or there are few places to grab a drink or food. So I'll probably wear a hydration pack. Otherwise I won't drink. And I'll be sticking cliff blocks to my top tube so they're easily accessible. A little dirt mixed with my blocks, maybe. But that's been the best way I've been able to get the nutrition in. Any other ideas on how to access food or hydration during races when it's downright scary to let go of the handlebars? And any tip for pacing or other strategies that would or would be most appreciated from Kim? And she says, thank you and love the podcast and Plan Builder. Awesome. Good to hear, Kim. So uh, first things first, Kim, you should definitely watch the race analysis video that we'll be having coming out. That's how to attack the fur or the start of a cross country mountain bike race, because that will give you some great tips on that aspect of it. But let's talk about the nutrition side of things. 
for cross country mountain biking, I even blocks are a little too like too substantial mm -hmm. for me at least. I, you guys uh, differ in opinion at all? Yeah, I, <clears throat> when a course is super technical, I'm, I'm all about fluids. I mean, mm -hmm. even gels can be a little hard to get down because with gels, you got a mouthful of goop, and then you also have to wash it down with a big mouthful of water. Yeah. So yeah, that's basically breaking the eating process into two stages, which if it's already hard enough to just grab a drink of water, that just complicates it beyond what, what I'll deal with. Yep, and with those blocks and everything else, you have to take in water with those for sure. Yeah, and chewing them so. is distracting too, trying to breathe and chew without launching your food or inhaling it, yeah. and that's a bit of a challenge. You can do like... Uh, <laughs> Please someone film that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can like kind of put the... I've seen a lot of people just take the block and put it in their cheek to the side, yeah. and they just let it break down. I feel like I'm just... Um, cording cavities in that case. Yes, you definitely are, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> dentists are probably really happy about that. But the other side of it is like, you know, it's basically what they're trying to avoid is the fact of having to chew food, break it down, and swallow it. Um, but the one thing that I've noticed with taking in blocks like that is that it just makes it so that it's it's almost like syrupy then thereafter, mm -hmm. and it kind of makes it nice and thick, hard to breathe, makes me, it gives me dry yeah, mouth. Yeah, like something that clears the mouth quickly. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I personally would would not do blocks. I would just stick to drink mix during cross country Olympic style races. And what I mean by that is like ninety minute or less races where the intensity is just mm -hmm. on. The That's whole time. about the cutoff. So I've been doing. Uh, I just did this ninety gram car mix. I actually brought two bottles on my mountain bike race, thinking, hey, it's going to be two hours. Let's do it the whole time. But I I couldn't drink enough, so I'm only going to do one bottle yeah. for two hours. If it was longer. Um, when you say you couldn't drink enough, is it because you couldn't physically take the bottle or is it because you couldn't tolerate it? Physically take the bottle yep. because there's so much so much turning and stuff. There wasn't enough time to be able to chug two bottles. So mm -hmm. I didn't need that extra, what, like a pound or pe yeah. of, of water to carry the whole time. It, that's the worst. We do a whole race <laughs> and you're like, why did I carry this the whole time? Yes. Uh, but yeah, that, I would do that. And um, that could even, based on intensity, could be too much for you. You, you have to experiment yeah. um, because the mountain bike races are intense. That's why hydrate like hydration packs are not just for long races. Like a hydration pack could just it makes it really easy Ease to be abuse. able to drink, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it can be right there. So you basically just pull your hand up, drink the thing, and then let it go, and it's fine. Um, yeah. So that is, and so if anybody says, "Oh, why are you wearing a hydration pack? This is a short race." Well, that's it. it, it it's logical to do so. Yeah. That it, granted, that is like extra weight. What I usually do in cross country Olympic races, if it has a lap uh, uh, setup, which most of them do, they have like laps that you end up repeating. In that case, many times I won't even carry a bottle on my bike. And I train specifically for this to be able to take my bottle and down a bottle, basically. Uh, just grab my bottle, hmm. drink as much as I can, drink as much as I can. Yeah. Five seconds, it's done. That's kind of like in the feed zone or that one. I'm thinking back to the race that we're going to have on the race analysis for you, but kind of like that paved section, something yeah. like that. They give you a bottle of water there that you can just grab and chug, and I might even yeah. try that. Yeah, because and that's what I would do to <clears throat> take in the mix, and I did find, for what it's worth, that taking in mix like that, because I'd have you know basically like 90 grams in a bottle there, that would be pretty hard for my stomach at first, but I got to the point where my stomach could handle it no problem. I just had to kind of practice with that and train with that. And train the way I did that was indoor workouts. I would just, after the first or second interval, I would just down that whole bottle mm -hmm. and then that bottle would be done. And that the, the nice thing about that is I never had to like question, number one, if I was drinking enough. Number two, when am I going to take a drink? And number three, it also never, I never had to worry about the fact of having to drop a bottle. Cause that's like a, if you grab a bottle in the feed zone, you put it on your bike and then you try to take a drink at another point and it's your first time drinking <laughs> that bottle and you drop it, you might as well. I mean, you just wasted time and you got no drink, right? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of tricky. So, um, in short races like that, if it has laps, you might be able to just take bottles and down those bottles. That's kind of like the, the best scenario, but a hydration pack is makes sense to me not a bad way to go yeah for sure so uh cool uh so should we talk a little bit i guess kind of just delve in on the strategy a little bit of yeah. uh, kind of starting the races yeah let's yeah um so I, I think that one part that i think a lot of people think is that like everybody can go really hard or everybody goes really hard in the beginning of every mountain bike race because you're fighting for a position and that's not just like to get in front of specific riders, but it's also because there's like a there's like a, a cumulative effect when one rider slows down, it pushes back, and then that ends up, you know, th their half second hesitation causes you costs you five seconds, and then multiply that times every turn that you come into, and you've really lost a lot of time that you're mm -hmm. just not going to be able to make up, right? So that's what we're talking about there. 
And like everybody does go really hard in the first bit, but the best riders go just hard enough. And I think that that's a big difference and, and the efficiency. And once again, watch the video that we'll have is probably the biggest grab. I feel like, like, um, it, it, how do you know what's just hard enough? I think that you have to, I mean, so two, three, three ways, probably number one, you have to know what you can do through training. Right. And you have to, and like, I, I would never watch heart rate in the beginning of a race. Cause if I watched that, I would like freak out because yeah. it's, you know, race nerves, everything else is way it's up. Nearly meaningless. Yeah, exactly. But I know roughly what I can do through training. And then I still, I do glance at normalized power. I don't say like, I'm going to pace by this, but I glance at it to kind of have a barometer of where I'm feeling to what I'm actually doing. And then kind of figuring that out. If it says like 400. After two minutes, you're like, oh, oh. this is going to be bad. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm, I'm probably before that first 10 crucial 10 minutes, I'm probably going to blow up is what that means to me. And then it's going to be really hard to come back from that. Right. So you have to kind of know what your limits are and you can use the PRs feature for that. It's so good. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at your rides on trainer road and then you look at the first 10 minutes of similar races like that, and then you look at training for that same duration, you'll be able to see like what you you may actually be able to do more than that. It's, and what you'll see is that through PRs, you in workouts, you've done more, but in races you do less. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because you were inefficient. Like we see a lot of like surging and really hard surging when you're caught behind people or not trying to be smooth in those first 10 minutes. And that's one of the big takeaways, just less surging, more smooth, consistent power. Mm -hmm. It'll, it'll really help. And you have to brace yourself for it, both mentally and physically. I mean, you have to, you have to have done the training that shows you that you can do this sort of event. Something that might help you recognize when you're going too hard, when you can push harder. Um, and, and, and psychologically, you have to be willing to, to go there. I mean, if you know I have a good crack at making the podium at this race, I need to stay within the top five, six riders, mm -hmm. you got to make yourself do it. It's not something that's going to fall into your lap unless you happen to be the fittest rider, and even then you're going to have to do a lot of work. Yeah, like very, in my opinion, or in my experience, very few times have I been in a race where a truly risky move wasn't necessary to win. Hmm. You know, like, like it, it, it would be great if we were in such a privileged position to be able to not take major risks and still win. Sure. But in almost every case for all of us listening to this, <clears throat> we have to take big risks. With mass start races, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. this goes for criterium, for cyclocross, for mountain bike, both the both uh, Olympic and marathon distances. But there aren't many races. I mean, triathlon would be one. A time trial would be one. Um what else? I mean, maybe a, a road race with a neutral rollout, but most mm -hmm. time, most of the time when you put a bunch of racers at a start line and fire that gun, it's chaos. Yep. I and mean, everyone goes as hard as they can for as long as they can to make, to, to position themselves where they want to be. And one thing to remember is or that just it's, to hang on. Yeah. It's not going to be that hard the whole time. Yeah. Like it will be hard for a while. It will hurt. You'll be very uncomfortable. And you just have to basically look at this and say, is this something that where I'm, I'm comfortable going this mm -hmm. deep? And then knowing that I'm going to be in a bit of a hole to come out of, or should I put myself in a bigger hole because the position is worth it? So you constantly have to weigh, right? Positioning versus yeah. what you have in the tank and what you can recover and from. And absolutely practice it. Again, I mean, th there's there's obviously the fitness that comes with throwing down a really hard effort and then settling into a 90% interval fo that, that immediately follows it. But there's also a benefit in knowing how that feels. So the psychological end of things is once again, really relevant here. So I mean, you'll notice in any of the specialty plans and even some of the plans leading up to it, maybe in the build phase, there will be these exact types of efforts to again, brace you for, to teach your body how to recruit a bunch of muscle, to teach you that you can go really hard <laughs> and only back off so much below threshold and actually sustain it. And in some of the cases, the workouts will bring you, you know, that sustained portion will start at 85%, but by the time you come to the end of the build, especially you'll be at 95% because that's more realistic rel relative to your course characteristics or the type of, uh, whether you're XCO or XCM sort mm -hmm. of nature. Yeah, and you'll actually, in that race analysis video that we, that will be coming up in the next couple of days here, you'll be able to see where Nate and I actually kind of go in and we look at your power profile and we talk about, what you see versus what you would want to see in a race at different points of the race. It wasn't the same thing. <laughs> Usually <laughs> no, it wasn't, was in it? my case, it's very different too. There's an ideal and I rarely hit the ideal. Right. But, um, it, it, it is, it is smoother than we think. And once again, it'll always, it'll always drop down. Don't worry. It's not going to be, your eyes won't be bleeding the whole time. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just that applies to a lot of things. I mean, if you have a circuit, like a, a five circuit road race, maybe there are 15, 20, 20 mile circuits, yeah. the first couple, or at least that first one is going to be discouragingly different. 
difficult. Mm -hmm. And there's probably nobody in there, save for the very fastest riders that are okay with it. Mm -hmm. But you, you bear it out. And before you know it, you know, everyone's human, everyone's hurting. It will settle down to a pace that's sustainable or, you know, maybe it won't, but that's, that's at that point, more testament to your fitness for sure. And, and, the, yeah, were you talking about that this time? Well, we have time about what well, number five? One? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, oh, for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, no um, what one thing really quick? You're going to race again this weekend, and then we're going to have two pro mountain bikers uh, critique you. Maybe even I might join in on the critique, but I think you'll get enough with just those two. Uh, uh, so you get two pro mountain bikers critiquing you. So that's going to be coming up on our YouTube channel soon. Which two pros? Uh, Keegan Swenson and Ryan Standish. So that'll be fun. Pretty amazing. Ryan Standish, uh, Australian-American, so his accent's going to be awesome. Uh, he also is like, if we call him V10. He has an insane amount of power, <laughs> huge threshold, like plus 400-watt threshold, just a, a, a big guy. Um, but also very savvy racers. And who's Keegan? You haven't mentioned him before. <laughs> Never Who is this Keegan nope. you speak of? Google him. You'll figure it out. No, uh, I should say he's the <laughs> sure, yeah. pro cross-country national champion for the U.S. Current national champion. Yeah. Yep. Rides for Stan, the Stan's pivot team. Heck of a rider. And also very detail-oriented, so he's good for this sort of stuff. Because there are many pro riders who are not very detail-oriented, so they're kind of like, Nate, just press hard yeah, on the pedals exactly. like, <laughs> shred send it dude yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> standish maybe more toward that end of the spectrum so it'll be really funny to hear both mm. of them quick story so, i was in Truckee yeah. getting coffee yeah. and i was getting a, a, a americano and uh Truckee's like known for like bro culture yeah and i was like uh how many shots are in there i was like actually i'll get four she goes yeah bro send it <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah, but, that's awesome yeah. i like that um so up on our youtube channel you can find the how to attack to or how to attack the start of the next cmtb race in the next couple days that'll be up also winning the sprint sprint when your breakaway fails that was the video that uh they critiqued my cat three finish so it's kind of cool you <laughs> won i you made it so i won the cat three race last year mm -hmm. and then you won the cat three race same same course uh this mm -hmm. year yeah go us we got it yeah, yeah. go us on our blog and we which... both got dropped from the p1 too <laughs> <laughs> right. but yeah that was your third race of the day and you did a breakaway that's different yeah me yeah. i just did wasn't very good um uh, if you go to blog.trainerroad.com you can also check out all the things that we put up so megan wrote an article on how to use plan builder for leadville 100 that broke out like a few different scenarios it's absolutely not too late to start training for leadville even especially with plan builder because it works it all out for yeah. you um, but we also go into situations if you've been training since like September of last year, whatever it is, uh, you can use it. Uh, so nice job Megan on that. Then how do you use season match to compare PRs? We've said this so many times, probably one of our least or like most underutilized features is the, are the PRs and season match. It will give you a perfect indication of whether your training is working every step along the way, instead of waiting until your goal event to find out if your training is working. hoping for the best. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's motivating. Because then you're, you're able, you know, you make seasons and you get trophies and it's fantastic. Like we were talking about earlier, motivation, uh, rest week, nutrition, Megan wrote on that too. We talked about this on the podcast, but she broke down the main points of basically like if, because the assumption is like during rest week, I should cut back salad time, you know, and like, or what I should do. And mm -hmm. so we talk about that and how it should change. And the final thing is, uh, Jesse broke down really well, by the way, he kind of broke down the main points on that winning the sprint when your breakaway fails video that we have. He broke down the main points. I would look at that if you're a bike racer, look at that article and like kind of like highlight it, so to speak, because there are so many great, he does a, he used to be a middle school teacher and he has like this great way of making, like putting things into phrases that just stick with you nice. and click. So I uh, did a great job with that. So check all that out. Will's question. Uh, it says, Hey guys, per usual, great product, amazing forum, killer podcast, five stars for sure. Thank you. Will. you can nice leave work. those. Yeah. You can leave those reviews for the podcast and any podcast app you use, but also you can go to trainerroadcom slash reviews and you can leave a review just for trainer road in general there. We would love that more of those would be great. Uh, so he says, uh, I think trainer road is by far one of the best resources we, use, we as cyclists or endurance athletes in general have to get faster, stronger, and healthier. Thanks for all your work. We agree. It says, given that it is January and there are plenty of your users taking part in dry January, and it was January, we, we just lapsed just barely. He says, or reducing or eliminating alcohol altogether, as evidenced by a few great threads on the forum, I thought it would be interesting to get your take by, or get your take and maybe a Coach Chad deep dive on non-alcoholic beers. If uh, the thing that we've been talking about that you should join us on YouTube for, I think Chad's, uh, I don't want to say you're five beers deep because I don't think that you've really gotten much of these he's, ones down. He's uh, tasting. Five sips deep. <laughs> yeah, five <laughs> sips deep. Yeah. Uh, so 
Uh, he says, I know you regularly touch on alcohol and its effects on our bodies and the priority uh, it's uh, and and the priority its removal is given to our or by our bodily systems. But I would love to hear some analysis of non-alcoholic beers. Chad mentioned last January that he uh, he was about to start trying some out. And given that he is, of course, a fan of good beer, I think his opinion would be interesting. Of course, these are potentially less nutritional calories than other foods that may be, and he says in quotes, better for us. But do you see a place where a non-alcoholic beer fits well into the performance-minded athlete's life? Thanks in advance and looking forward to your feedback from Will. And this makes sense because I just want to recap really quick. We've covered alcohol before. If you look up Ask Mm -hmm. a Cycling Coach podcast alcohol, you'll see that where it's just hard to find any redeeming qualities of alcohol itself Mm -hmm. except for when we talk about the ability to – unplug relax and yeah. kind of in uh the, the psychological benefit that you get and with that. very moderate intake there is a, re- uh, a correlation with reductions in cardiovascular disease mm-hmm. so there is some upside to the occasional glass of wine sort of thing but i don't think that's what we're really talking about here mm-hmm. people want their after ride beers they're after uh, race beers yeah i'll pray and yep exactly so I do actually think there's a place um, on, on a few levels, and then once I started, no. to, once I started to dig into this, I actually saw that there are some potential health benefits, and and obviously the alcohol content in beer flies in the face of those benefits, or and maybe doesn't totally fly in the face of them. They they're still there, but you have to kind of package it with a literal poison. <laughs> so um, I understand why people would want to drink non-alcohol beer, <laughs> no. alcoholic beers, but actually drinking them is proving to be a, a, a something else entirely. Um, we, we got a few. I mean, I'm, I'm nothing if not thorough. So here we are with six <laughs> different beverages and uh, some of them are stinkers and some of them are palatable, but only barely. We However, should, we should run through the deep dive and then we should share your winners and losers sure. from this list. Yeah, I, I only just a, just a small cross section of what's out there. And, and one last thing before the deep dive, on behalf of all the listeners, we thank you for your thoroughness. Of oh, you're welcome. Willing to do this. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got nothing for it. I mean, but they're at least low calorie, very low calorie in some cases. There we go. Non in one in one's case. Okay, so first, it's important to understand that um, I, I am a beer drinker. And I fall victim to a whole purchase by ABV sort of uh, approach. Mm -hmm. I I like big booze beers, and it's typically because uh, I just drink a beer at a time, so like a lunch beer and a dinner beer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Occasionally, I'll I'll have two. So in in any case, the higher alcohol (laughs) seems to go with higher flavor. I mean, there's definitely a connection there. So I have a a beer classification system, a beer by ABV. ABV is alcohol. He'll let you know if he sees you. If he's got one of the beers and he sees you drinking something else, he lets you know. He'll be in a certain class. For those who don't know, ABV is alcohol by volume. So that's the percentage of alcohol in in your drink. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I've reclassified because it, it wasn't so PG before, so now it's fully G-rated. Um, anything under 6%, I, I call it fruit juice. And I know it's <laughs> it's grains and flowers. There's no fruit in it. But it's, it's the equivalent of fruit juice because you're getting so much of, oh, man, how to put this? It's like fruit juice. I mean, you basically take out what's really valuable in it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it be like Bud Light, yeah, Coors Light, stuff like that. Yeah, really anything below 6%, and there's a lot. Yeah, But that's, those are the types of beers. Yep. Yep. Lagers, usually. Um, ales usually kick upward. Um, and then anything from 6 to 9%, that's where I call it a session beer. So all these f- sub-5, sub-4, sub-3% beers that are deemed session beers so that you can Disgusting. drink a lot of them. I don't get it. I don't want to drink a lot of beer. I just want to drink of a little bit of really good beer. Opinions of <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, anything above 9% is proper. That's that's my term. That's a proper beer. That's close to wine. Some it of is. your beers are it just is. like large glasses of wine. <laughs> In terms of alcohol content, yeah. That's true. Um, okay, so first off, Non-alcoholic beer is anything with less than half a percent ABV, so mm-hmm. 0.5 percent or lower. Um, in, in some cases, you can find completely non-alcoholic zero, and in that case, and in all cases, lower calorie and typically non-diuretic, mm-hmm. or they are if they're below uh, 0.5 percent, so they won't dehydrate you. Mm-hmm. That's that's a good thing right there. Still serves as the reward. If you can get past the taste, I mean, that's, that's, I'm trying real hard. Um, But, you know, if you're used to lighter beers, then making the jump to a non-alcoholic beer is not going to be as big of a leap as a guy who prefers higher alcohol beers. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So what follows, I have to attribute or I have to thank a, a website called SteadyDrinker.com, <laughs> which isn't what it sounds like. Is it about you? It, no, it's not. It's about non-alcoholic beverages. I or just beers. want to think of like that that person's children when they're at school. They're like, what does your dad do? And it's like, oh, he's a steady drinker. <laughs> have you ever been to SteadyDrinker.com? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, okay. So the uh, on this website steadydrinker.com they tied to a lot of studies and uh, little bits of information on some of the benefits of even non-alcoholic beer and this applies to beer across the the board really cool. because it's it's the ingredients of beer um, it, it kind of diminishes along with alcohol I mean the, the, the lower the alcohol the lower some of these the content of some of these things but uh, <laughs> let, let's not get hung up on that there are benefits that go with both alcoholic and non-alcoholic beer one of which is the brain release of dopamine. So you're still getting these little reward center triggers. They attribute this to, or this study attributed it to alcohol associated flavor cues. So at some point you had to have the alcohol associate the, the, the warm fuzzy with that flavor. And then you get a little bit of it when you drink a non-alcoholic version of it. That's, so yeah. that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then by the way, all these studies will be linked to, I applied links that uh, Tucker can can slap into the forum. Mm -hmm. um, similar brain-related reward tied to consumption experience of, of beer flavor. So again, it's not tied to the ethanol or the alcohol content of the beer so much as the consumption experience. Just the idea of drinking a beer can be enough of a motivation to you know make you tough out those last couple of intervals or to to feel like a reward after a race, etc. Mm -hmm. um, there are non-alcoholic components of beer that inhibit thrombogenic activity. So thromboses are, you know, circulatory blood clots. Mm -hmm. Those never end well. There's yes. <laughs> that's, that's just, there's no, there's no upside right. of a thrombosis. And if, you know, non-alcoholic components of beer can diminish the likelihood or, or decrease that activity, that's a win. Mm -hmm. um, phenols, we've talked about phenols. In many cases, polyphenols usually, um, these are antioxidants. And while they are lowest in the non-alcoholic beers, there is a, an antioxidant quality was clearly superior to that of vitamin antioxidants. So they actually say because of this antioxidant synergism in beer, so the combination of the ingredients, that the antioxidants in this form were more healthful or more productive than just popping a pill, which is you know strictly that one antioxidant or blend of whatever. Chalking up a lot of reasons. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, there were a couple studies that showed, um, in this case, the phenols or the antioxidants, Inhibit atherosclerosis, which is the arterial plaque accumulation that narrows our blood vessels. It creates a problem, especially when combined with the thromboses I just mentioned. Um, reduces cholesterol. Let's go ahead and throw away those statins. Drink beer. <laughs> and lower blood triglycerides. All desirable outcomes, right? Yep. Um, linked to all those studies as well. And then a couple studies that showed the non-alcoholic beer reduces inflammation and reduces the incidence of respiratory tract illness. Huh. Right? So chest colds. Yeah. Nate, Nate just stepped yeah. out really quickly. Nate, there's lots of reasons to drink. That's where yeah, we're going it, on this. Yeah. Is, you're going to want to watch this later. Um, and then when it comes to rehydration, there was one study by uh, done by the Journal of Applied Physiology where beverages up to 2% alcohol content don't impact recovery from dehydration. So they don't – they actually rehydrate. Hmm. You know, it's it's more – the content of alcohol isn't enough to, to uh, turn it into a diuretic. Got it. And tipping point has been reached. Exactly. And then uh, hops. So hops themselves, which is an, are an ingredient in I'm pretty sure every kind of beer, ales, lagers, everything. Um, there are antibacterial components. So they um, hops contain a high concentration of both alpha and beta acids, and these inhibit the growth of what are called gram-positive bacteria. So this is a particular type. I mean, just antibacterial doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. But in this case, it does because these gram-positive bacteria are the Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Pneumococcus, um, the bacteria that cause diphtheria and anthrax. So these are bacteria that obviously are not desirable. I want to say uh, I'm doing this live, so I'm probably wrong, but this is really <laughs> this this and 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 <laughs> some type of ferm to, <laughs> ferment, fermentation of wine has helped humans like. Um, in places mm -hmm. where bad water sources were, mm -hmm. to have like fermented uh, yeah. alcohol, so you could drink that mm -hmm. low alcohol, still be hydrated and not die. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's. A, I think Benjamin Franklin says like he has some quote about. Yeah, he does. Yeah, that's right. Where in water there's yeah. bacteria, in wine there's life, and in beer there's like yeah. friendship or something like that. Mm. Yeah, that's, but anyways, that's a good one. Yeah, 
Okay. I, I butchered it, but you Google it. That's okay. Yeah. Paraphrase. Thanks, Jed. Sure. <laughs> okay, back to hops. The, uh, another study showed a sedative effect of non-alcoholic beer, and this was done on healthy female nurses, but it apparently raises a neurotransmitter called GABA, which is a topic we could touch on at another time. But anyway, it had sedative effects. So, you know, relaxing, help them sleep. Um, then when it comes to hops and grain, they're both rich sources of silicon, which strengthens bones. And... Um, a book I'm reading at the moment called Eat to Beat Disease, Eat to Beat Disease, say that a little slower, author William Lee, MD, um, he talks about a particular, uh, I think it's a neurotransmitter, I don't know, it's called xanthohumerol, uh, in one study where he looked at people who were drinking five to seven beers per week, so we're talking like a beer a day, they saw a 33% reduction in risk for kidney cancer, a 24% reduction in risk for colon cancer, which they directly attributed to xanthohumerol. Interesting. Interesting. So just a, a constituent or a, or a component of uh, – it might have been beer. It might have been part of the hops. I lost I lost the plot at that point. But uh, <laughs> And then finally, vitamins and minerals in beer. We got B2, B3, B6, B7, B9, which is folic acid. Pregnant mm-hmm. women, hello. And <laughs> joy. <laughs> no. Totally kidding. Totally no. kidding. Totally oh kidding. My God. Non-alcoholic <laughs> beer. We're talking about non-alcoholic With a zero beer. Percent. Yeah. yeah, exactly. B12, <laughs> calcium, potassium, zinc – Iron, selenium. <laughs> You're gonna tank us. Listen, listen, and sodium. There's an electrolyte in here. Yeah. Come well, on, you should do it's this. Basically I mean, it's basically Gatorade. a rehydration <laughs> beverage. When we do triathlons, you should only drink this one right here. I don't think I can. Honestly, <laughs> you can do it. Can I, we cover winners and losers right now? Yeah, I, I, I turned the losers away. I don't want to defame which, anybody. Which ones did I t- taste? You tasted this one and this one. This one. So What's, which ones? Which ones? So the, so the ones that are the most lagerous. So the IPA didn't work. The hazy IPA didn't work. The coffee cream brew berry didn't work. But the two that tried to keep it closer to lagers, which are already low alcohol beers. Mm-hmm. They're tolerable. I, I, mean, I wouldn't buy them. I wouldn't drink them by choice. And then this one, this Lagunitas, is, it's more like a, a seltzer. It's, it's actually like quite a, enjoyable, but it in no way makes me think of beer. It's a, oh, it's all zero. It's yeah. a non-hard, hard seltzer. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's actually exactly what it is. <laughs> Got it. So yeah. I like that one. What's that one called, Chad? Uh, athletic Brewing Company. First off, right? I think this is one that someone, someone on Strava recommended to me, and it's called Upside Dawn. Nate's like, of course I like that one. I don't even know yeah. if they consider them <laughs> lagers or ales oh, or anything. Tastes, They're just non alcoholic. That's that's actually pretty good too. Both though. these are okay, especially no, no, if one. you're coming from the lager side of things. Oh yeah. yeah. The he's he's pointing to the hard seltzer. Which the hard seltzer is? Oh, Lagunitas. Yeah, so Lagunitas is called the uh, Hoppy Refresher. And then the the other Hop. can? And then the other one is by Partake Brewing and it's their blonde. Cool. So So Tucker, can you put these three in there? I'm not a big fan of the one in the middle. But on the outsides, did like, you, you, like you tried this one? I, let me try it again. Because it's super similar <laughs> to, to this one. But I think, because uh, I like the, I agree, the relaxation quality of drinking a beer, even though it's not a beer. But I usually don't do it because I work out hard at night and I, I don't want to like interrupt the recovery process and sure. stuff. Yeah. Um, but we are, we just got a new backyard. I have like a built in grill. Nice. And I can put a little fridge out there. Yeah. And I feel like those two, I would be not guilty. And this is zero calories. And it's pretty good. And the other one, um, that's the Lagunitas. Uh, Hop. Yep. And the other one is, what, 50 calories? Uh, that's. Did you look at that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. 50 calories, uh, all carbs. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> right up my alley. So, uh, good, good transition for the next question. Yeah, too. that'd be. Uh, I'm kind of glad you did that. That'd be kind of fun. Thanks, Chad. Um, they'll have a real took, beer took and be like... several for the team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's go into... Can we Can we get through two more? Two I, more questions, you think? I'm ready let's to try. roll. Let's try it. Yeah. I got the middle cheers. one not so cheers, like an imaginary Cheers to two more going. With, my, with my sparkly water. There we cheers. go. Cheers. <laughs> cheers indeed. Cheers. Okay. Uh, Aaron says, accepted wisdom seems to be you can absorb 60 to 90 grams per hour on the bike, but what about <clears> off of it? For example, they ate 186 grams of carbs from oatmeal and blueberries. Good Lord. He got this from your Instagram, npearson99. Yeah, you're missing. Is that like yeah. in one sitting? Dude, yeah, I did that many times. And I, I did a video of me eating a box of... Because people didn't believe it. No, I remember that. Life. Yeah, yeah. It, like a high-speed video. Are you following me on Instagram? Grams. How do you remember that? Because I was there in Leadville when you ate the entire oh, no, box this of cereal. Is another one, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did it again? Yeah. Did you? I did it with time lapse. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Go, 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 go. Yes. So uh, he says, "I'm presuming this was absorbed over several hours. Otherwise, it gets turned to fat. Is there a standard rate of absorption while sedentary? Also, if unused carbs become fat, 
how can you ensure additional carbs and carb loading fill glycogen stores? That would be awesome, right? That's if I could like flip a switch and be like, only That's glycogen. That's the dream, Aaron. That's the yeah. dream right there. Yeah. It says, hopefully this hasn't been discussed on the pod before. I don't remember it being, uh, but could you point me to the right pod if so? And we haven't really discussed this specific context before of kind of like the activity versus inactivity yeah. and everything else. Yep. Uh, so, Chad, we have kind of a lot to cover on this one. How do you want to start with? Yeah, it's a... Uh, can I drink this one? It's a lot. Yeah. Well, you mean. There's quite a lot, but let's let's start with. Um, I want to address two things. First off, he talks about. Um, I want to talk about absorption because it's different from what we're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we get to that, the whole sixty to ninety grams per hour on the bike thing, we pretty much debunked that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we we've got strong evidence that shows that you can do the whole two to one glucose to fructose ratio, but now we can do a one to one ratio, which means one hundred twenty grams. But there's indications, evidence of athletes processing as high as one hundred forty four grams per hour, which means even that one-to-one -one doesn't stand up anymore, or if it does, maybe it's more like 70 grams of each. In any case, this is something that can be addressed with, with training and, and tolerance. I mean, Nate's a good example of, I don't know if he could have dove right into eating 186 grams of something a couple of years ago. Is this something you've worked up to? Uh, probably started when I was about 11. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> it's been after it for quite some time. But, you know, if you're willing to do the work. Seriously, I was growing a lot. <laughs> In eighth grade, I grew a foot, literal foot during the school year. That's amazing. I was expecting a couple of years ago, I don't know, college maybe, not, not 11 years old. Sorry. Fresh out the womb. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. And, and, okay. and for what it's worth, too, N equals 1 on this. I've been able, with a 2 to 1 ratio, been able to take in. 110 uh, up to almost 120 without the yes. stress. So the, the you've showed yourself. You've showed yourself. I, the mm -hmm. constant it's is it. it's going to be – it's like individual. Yes. And you need to test well, and it. train. It, it's yeah. subjective, but not only can we predict what's going to happen, we can also measure what happens. So so we've got a lot to work with here. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so let's, let's cover some basics. Um, in terms of carbohydrate, especially at least for our discussion, it really falls into three broad categories. Um, one is digested by human, so you know what we actually digest, digested by the microbiota. So what actually makes it all the way through the or most of the way through the digestive tract and feeds the the microbes in our gut, and then that which passes undigested. Okay, all we're going to talk about here is what's digested by us. So what what what's digested by basically the small intestine, mm -hmm. and so so when you talk about absorbed, I think you mean utilized because you're talking about how much gets utilized by the working muscles. Rather, absorption is simply the uptake of the nutrients into the bloodstream. So they're not exactly the same thing, but I'm not trying to split hairs here. I just want to be clear mm -hmm. on what we're talking about. <clears throat> so carbohydrate, once it's in the blood, it, it's glucose at that point. It's, it's gone through, you know, it's been to the liver. It's been kicked out. Either way, it's, it, it's in the bloodstream now. All but four grams has to be cleared. We can't really keep much more than four grams in the bloodstream at any one time. And this assumes, you know, we're talking about healthy non-diabetic or you know, non-pre-diabetic folks, people who with normal blood sugar content and normal insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, so past that, carbohydrate basically has three def destinations. It's either the liver, the muscle, or the fat. So if it goes into the liver, it's either uh, converted into glucose, kicked out in the bloodstream and used where it's needed, or it's packed away as glycogen. Mm -hmm. largely to fuel the brain or the nervous system. Um, with the muscles, kind of the same scenario. Either the glucose is put to use because the muscle is working or it's packaged away as glycogen for later use. And then with fat, it's just packaged as triglycerides and stored for later use. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's got to go one of those three directions. Um, the, the fat storage end of things happens under a couple circumstances. One, our glycogen stores are full in both the liver and the muscles. Or we're outpacing our glycogen synthesis rate. Glycogen can only be synthesized at a certain rate. And if we're cramming carbohydrate into the system at a rate faster than that, what's your body going to do but sock this away as fat? Some will get stored as glycogen, yes, relative to the, the repletion rate. Some is going to get packaged away as fat. And that's not necessarily the worst thing because fat can be utilized too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not to say that you're going to be stuck with excess body fat. You can use excess body fat. But in the terms of carb loading... Mm -hmm. That's not, so it's not yeah, so let's the talk. Goal. Yeah, so let's talk carb loading, or a little more toward carb loading. Um, if you hearken back to episode two thirty four, I mentioned Dr. Alex Harrison and his book RP Diet for Endurance, and he cited the optimal or the the high end of glycogen repletion is about 0. 0.8 to one point two grams per kilogram of body weight per hour. Okay, so to put that into 
Um, and then in, in the recommendation across a lot of studies pretty much stacks up or pretty much uh, coincides with that. They say 1 to 1.2 grams of carbohydrate ingested per kilogram per body per hour to reload glycogen stores. Now, if we're using Nate as an example, I think the time when he d- did Leadville, that. at the time, oh, yeah. I think you were close to 180, right? Maybe. No, I was like 185. But okay. anyways. Let's say 180 take because it, that's, it, I've done math. It. I've Run done math with, with 180. You just lost weight. <laughs> um, so, so that's 82 kilograms. Um, so we're looking at, you know, with this 1 to 1.2 grams per hour, we're looking in the ballpark of 80 to 100 grams per hour. And this is, this is, again, is carb loading or repletion after depletion. So if Nate were to eat 100 grams per hour, theoretically, he could store 800 grams over the course of eight hours, which would pretty would really top up some stores. <laughs> I mean, he's probably that high because he's got big glycogen stores in his muscles, liver. I don't even know if you can really influence how much your liver stores. Probably can. I don't know. Um, but in any case, we, we typically think, you know, about 400 in the muscles, about 100 in the liver. So right around 500, 550 are the numbers for, you know, normal, untrained folks. Endurance athletes, however, can influence this, and we do through, you know, repletion, depletion, et cetera. We go, we go about it specifically because we need greater exercise or greater energy stores. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and it's worth noting that at this 800 grams that we're talking about, this is that 10 grams, that mythical 10 grams per kilogram per day that mm-hmm. seems to hold, that seems to carry across studies when it comes to carb loading and to address large deficits. So you run yourself down after Leadville. These are the sort of things that... This is the sort of intake, carbohydrate intake, that you should be looking at if you want to completely reload. And it, that's a lot. It's a ton. That's, a, that's hard to eat. It's a heck of a lot of food. I mean, do the math on it. It's a lot of calories that all come from carbohydrate. Nate's not scared. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm scared. If you're, <laughs> you if you're an endurance afraid. athlete, you kind of got to get okay with these things, especially if you want to do long days like Leadville. Yes. One person DK. messaged me and saw the food and was like, that wasn't very much. I can do that. The, the thing that I think people realize is the bowl that I take pictures in is not, our, is not a regular size bowl. This They're is like so not. a family salad bowl. Because if you look at it, like... I it's like you put bowl, like a can of Coke next to it for perspective. Yeah. I need to. I it's, know. But. It's the bowl that you put the salad in to feed your entire family. Yeah. And that's what you're eating. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. So back to the, if he's doing a hundred grams of carbohydrate per hour and he wants to do that for eight hours to completely get back on track, it doesn't work that tidily. Uh, max synthesis rates last for about, you know, in the ballpark of four hours, according to most of the studies I went over. And then afterwards it drop, drops to about 50%. So really you have this four hour window where you can synthesize glycogen at this really high rate, but then it precipitously declines. Is that like four hours post-exercise or what? See, that that depends too. So, um, but uh, along these same lines, let me, cool. I'll, I'll yeah, get to that. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- there have been studies where rather than waiting every hour on the hour to, to ingest more carbohydrate, athletes are doing it at 15 and 30 minute in- intervals. Um, with the 15s, they do it for a couple hours. With the 30s, they do it for for four hours. But in any case, they see higher levels or higher rates of glycogen repletion if they're doing these smaller, more frequent doses. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. You kind of do that. You're changing my world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can't wait to put these into application. Sure, sure. Okay, so now kind of kind of along the lines of what you're asking about. So glycogen uh, recent, uh, synthesis takes place under three very different scenarios. And and these are important to keep in mind because the difference between a post-exercise athlete, an athlete in the midst of exercise, and an athlete um, prior to Mm -hmm. ingests and and, uh, synthesizes, ingests carbohydrate and synthesizes glycogen at different rates. So post-exercise, um, it's kind of like uh, the, geez, what we talk about, the ATPPC, the, the phosphocreatin the other day, and, and it's a biphasic process. So at first it's really rapid, and then it slows down. Mm. Um, the first phase is much faster, like along the lines of three to, time, three to ten times faster than the second phase. This phase, this first phase, is insulin independent, which is a strong case for excess carbohydrate content during the ride. So, so you could finish a ride. You don't even have to eat anything, but there's extra glucose floating around, extra carbohydrate that needs to be processed. You don't need insulin to take it into the cells because of these, these different transport mechanisms. So that excess toward the end of the ride can actually start repleting these glycogen stores. You get a head start on it or a jump start. We've talked to people about the questions like, should I be drinking anything in the last 20 minutes because mm-hmm. uh, I, don't, I only have 20 minutes of work and I'm not going to absorb it. But you're, I think you have a really good case right here. Yeah. Because if, if you're going to have the, the carbohydrate, might as well go to your muscles than fat, right? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yep. And that is something that you're uh, particularly inclined to do, to pack it away in the muscles post 
post exercise once you've mm -hmm. been basically depleting those same stores, mm -hmm. or not the same stores, but depleting your existing stores. Um, so, and then 30 to 40 minutes or so, the rate starts to decline. Um, this has nothing to do with that mythical or 30 minutes post, 60 minutes post. That's it's something else. Just the, the rate of repletion, assuming you're still ingesting carbohydrate, starts to tip downward after about 30 to 4 minutes, according to this particular study or meta. I'm not sure where I got this. Um, so, oh, oh, but favorable glycogen synthesis responses, so a lot of things that take place are still present up to, you know, to, to, to lesser and lesser degrees, up to about 48 hours afterward. Hmm. So, so over the course of the next two days, your body's a little more concerned with packing glycogen back into the muscles. Um, and then it's depletion level dependent, meaning that if you run them way down, you're going to replete more quickly. Okay. If you only run them down a little bit, your body just doesn't face the same impetus. That's probably why athletes are better at packing things away. Like we talked about probably draining, because we continually draining. run those stores down and send the message that we need bigger stores or we at least need to replenish them mm -hmm. rapidly. Um, and then during exercise glycogenesis, which is the creation of glycogen. So, you know, the making of glycogen um, declines. I don't know if it halts, but it definitely declines until exercise ceases. I mean, just think about it. You're not going to be packing away the glucose that your muscles actually need in that moment. Mm -hmm. And then during non-exercise, so just sitting around, you know, and long since uh, a workout, there's, there's, there's no after effects, although there, there might be, but let's just say you're well past the point of that, that uptick in glycogen synthesis rate. It's, it's still dependent on the level of depletion. So the lower levels yield higher synthesis rates. So again, really run them down. They're more inclined to to build back up, um, your capacity for glycogen storage is obviously going to influence it. I mean, if you're untrained and you can only really store 400, you might as well not slam 800 grams of, cal of, of carbohydrate over the next eight hours. Um, that's a big, that's like a thing. I'm always confused mm -hmm. about that too. And then like, for, so at my weight, I'm 6'6", six, six, if you didn't know. And, <laughs> but like, I've heard, uh, I've heard tale. I have, uh, it's going to be like if someone is six feet tall in the same weight, and they're more muscles, they're gonna have more glycogen, right? Mm -hmm. So like and, and, it, and size of muscles that so your capacity for storage. Exactly. So it's gonna be different. And that's why I think that I think maybe ten might be a little bit much for me because I don't have a ton of muscle. Um, my legs are Probably are not is. really big because most a lot of my weights and it's like skeletal and because uh, you're so tall. Yeah, ex exactly. Um I don't really know what the answer is there, but I'd, mm. I'd love to like figure it out. But yeah, the, different the, body the types. overall weight, yeah, exactly yeah. isn't yeah, it yep. doesn't tell the whole story. And if you're sorry, if you're obese, then like really it's going to be, you don't want to do it because sure. you, you're not going to be able to store glycogen in your fat. Yes. That should make sense. A little bit. You can actually. But you put glycogen fat? Yeah. Glycogen <laughs> or fat does contain trace trace levels of. Nate's well, head. Again, Boom. this is something I learned over the course of this, this particular uh, research. Um, so another thing during non-exercise, um, the rate of carbohydrate ingestion. So again, you can't just pound more than your body can synthesize into glycogen and the type of carbohydrate ingested. So this goes to that whole high glycemic, low glycemic. And, and when you're in these, the, you know, the, the, the we're talking non-exercise here, but when you're post-exercise, it's the high glycemic stuff that's going to load the stores up more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and then this, these are kind of some interesting side notes. Studies have shown that most athletes operate at rarely full glycogen levels. We're almost always in some level of glycogen deficit. Speak for it's yourself. not often. Yeah, <laughs> most of us. It's not often that you, you that you run them down and put them all the way back up capa to capacity. Athletes simply can't keep up with it. And certain constraints impose themselves, and we just simply cannot get enough carbohydrate to come to the workout table every time with completely full stores. This actually works in our favor, though, because we're always operating at this deficit, which is what sends the stimulus or one of the stimuli to greater glycogen, greater levels of glycogen storage. Um, but what's interesting, furthermore, and along those lines, is that moderate carbohydrate intake versus high carbohydrate intake. So we're talking about 5 grams per kilogram per day and 10 grams per kilogram per day. So, so way high up there. Didn't impair. So over a seven-day study, it didn't impair exercise performance, didn't impair training capacity. So you can still get the job done. You're just doing it with dwindling glycogen stores. So in the case of like a, a grand tour mm -hmm. athlete who has to do it for three weeks in a row, Big concern. Someone who's only doing a seven-day stage race, not so much. What about a three-week training block? Yeah, that would be another strong case for really staying on top of it, being more toward that 10 grams per kilogram per day than the five. That's just mm -hmm. so hard. <clears throat> so also worth noting, and this is important stuff, is that muscle damage can retard the rate of glycogen 
synthesis. So if you go do a really hard workout and you're slamming the carbohydrate, it might not all synthesize as much glycogen as it would if you allowed yourself to more thoroughly recover before you tried to address this particular issue. Um, adding protein has been shown to stimulate rapid glycogenesis. So we've talked about this a lot of times. What is the benefit of that little dose of protein in my post-workout drink? Does it actually carry any weight? Well, in the case of uh, repletion of glycogen stores, it carries quite a lot of weight, and it's more of a 1 to 3 ratio than a 1 to 4. So they're looking at 0.3 to 0.4 grams per kilogram per body weight for every one of those grams of carbohydrate. Mm. So just a little bit, but enough that it actually facilitates um, glycogen repletion. Um, it doesn't necessarily have any impact on how quickly you replenish those glycogen stores if you're eating, you know, the, the gram per kilogram per hour. So if you're getting sufficient car uh, carbohydrate, the protein doesn't really have any further benefit, but it doesn't come at any detriment to the, to the glycogen repletion. And it does have all the protein benefits of resynthesizing muscle and, you know, any other benefits of protein. But the, the, the takeaway from all of this is that unless you're directly measuring glycogen in the muscle, and it is possible to do this and not just through biopsy, but also through ultrasound devices, which are very costly, we're finding, yeah. um, yeah. it's a bit of a guessing game. So uh, less of a guessing game if you monitor, monitor body composition. So if you have a scale and you're looking at water weight and you're looking at fat and you're looking at lean muscle tissue, it's less of a guessing game, but still you, you can't know how much is in the muscle without actually directly measuring the content of the muscle. Be amazing. And then finally, let me just, uh, for anybody who wants to look into this more, um, this, a lot of this, most of this came from a, a article titled Fundamentals of Glycogen Metabolism for Coaches and Athletes. And that's Bob Murray and Christine Rosenblum. John Ivey's a really good resource. We'll link to one of his studies. And Gregory Tardy, PhD, is also a good resource on this matter. We'll link to one of his studies. Cool. So here's what I might try next time. Okay. <laughs> just based off this. So what we said that for... Like the first four hours of like hard loading, and then it starts to reduce, right? Yeah, about yeah. And I'm so, sure these aren't hard numbers, but yeah, but in about general, that. yeah. Um, two, one thing you know, what this sounds like. Uh, remember the carb trickle days? Yeah. yeah. I just didn't do enough, like my serving size of par paraboiled rice, which is a low glycemic rice. Parboiled, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was doing that, but I was having like a half a cup at a time, right? Yeah. Not enough to impact it. So I want to spread it out. And it also sounds like. Um, I remember another study that showed that rice loaded better than bread. And that their idea was that bread has more surface area. It digests mm. more quickly. You get more of a spike. So all of this kind of sounds like mm. if you can if you can uh, make it like the carb, I guess carb blast <laughs> yeah. for a long time. But, but pretty much stretch it out, right? You don't want huge spikes. And uh, if I could get lower glycemic foods and foods that digest slower, yeah. I might be able to load better. You just better. don't want to outpace the repletion rate. Exactly, yep. Yeah. So if I can get that rate like just dialed into the right level. Mm -hmm. um, Which we can't measure, but at the same time. We, we can, can, yeah, but based on what we know about how we digest food, we can improve it. Yep. So yep. one thing like with the oatmeal, um, oatmeal has really high fiber, and that can slow digestion. Mm -hmm. So I don't know I don't know if I digested all that 186 grams in one hour. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, the whole calories in, calories out is it's really simple to calculate the calories in, but the, sure. how the calories go out, they can go out in so many different ways. And one of them is just to pass straight through you. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's like, what, undigested. I've had that happen too. And you probably have like triathletes in your big race. When you start getting gas and diarrhea, yeah. like and you're, you're drinking too much drink and you're just poof, pass right through you. And that's mm -hmm. the worst spot to be in. Yep. So I think what I might try because eating real food is really hard to do it the whole time. Mm -hmm. At least for that four hours, I might do 100 grams of carbs per hour in a maltodextrin drink, mm -hmm. which is a, it's like made from corn. It's a low glycemic index drink. That's yeah. really it's easy to get down. glucose. What? Grain glucose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I could do that maybe for the first four hours. Maybe I'll try that on some days, but like wake up and kind of do that four hours. Probably not good for long-term health. Uh, actually, <laughs> Probably <laughs> that's the really opposite. Not. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> I might try that before race day or maybe some on recovery days just to try to get because that's an easy way to then get 400 grams in and then eat some like fibrous vegetables and stuff that still have a lot of carbs mm -hmm. and then maybe another oatmeal or something at night and then try to race and see how see how I feel on that. Yeah. So basically, if you don't do all 800 grams in one sitting with like table sugar, like a Coke, <laughs> yeah. that would be bad. No, I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it'd be bad on, on a number of levels. Cool. I think this would be a great blog post. It'd be fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Jesse, yeah. Megan. There are a few key takeaways uh, on that one for sure. It's a little sure. complex, but yeah, there's like things you can do. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and those numbers, they, they, they may not resonate until you actually apply them to your body weight when you hear the, you know, one gram per kilogram per hour or the 0.3 or 0.4. But once you do the math and you know basically what your body weight is and your body weight's not going to vacillate that much, right? So you, you get a good idea of what it is you can tolerate both in terms of um, carbohydrate and, and timing and dosing, all that. Yeah. Uh, do we want to move into the final point and then some live questions? What's the final point? Uh, the the point five that we have on our dock. Oh, sure. Oh. All right. So uh, are we done with the carb thing? We are done. Cool. Yep. Uh, Nate, all set to you on that? I don't want to cut us off on that if there are oh, any yeah. other no. things. Follow me on Instagram if you want to hear more about carbs. <laughs> okay. True story. <laughs> and Pearson 99. That's the, that's the way to find the man. Um, okay. So uh, we've talked about this stage race that we haven't talked about uh, for quite a while. Uh, we've said that we are doing a stage race, but we haven't said what it is. Uh, some people have already figured it out on the forum, uh, but we're going to next week, you and I are going to go race Valley of the Sun. Stage yes, race. we are. And that's in Phoenix, Phoenix, Arizona. It starts with a time trial. It's going to be somewhere around 30 minutes, a little on the Flash. north side of it. Yep. Yeah. Kind of like a slight up on the way out, turn around, slight back, and it's just straight. There's just one 180, basically. There's a slight bend. but uh, And then after that, we have a 90-mile road race. Yep. And uh, with not a ton of climbing in it, but kind of like a fast climb. Yeah, like a high speed. Three percent. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. I yeah. think it peaks around five or six uh, from a video I saw. But I'm so fine. heavy right now. You'll yeah. be fine. Five six percent. That's still a power climb. Yep, I agree. And then after that, we have a crit that's really short. I think it's only like forty five minutes, or maybe no, it's more in Cat Two. Yeah, I don't know. But, but it's a uh, lots of turns. Lots of turns. So, um, Chad, I can't wait because I'm going to pick <clears throat> your rain on. I, I want you That'd to like fun. advise me on exactly what to do, <laughs> and then I'm just going to follow Chad's rules, and everything will be fine, and it'll when work the TT, out great. When the TT, when the race, when the crit. All he'll say. Yeah. Um, but along these lines, we should probably cover. Uh, so for this stage race, it's 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 particularly appropriate for me right now because. Uh, this weekend, if I race well and things go well, I should be able to get the points that I need to move up to Cat 2. Which means you guys get to race together. Which will be fun, because then that makes it interesting. It's a lot more exciting. Putting the cart yeah. before the horse a little bit. but I mean, Certainly. <laughs> well, like I said, if everything goes well and everything yeah. else, right? Yeah. yeah. And if In I race case, well, sure. In worst case, you race threes. Yep. Which I'm registered as now, uh, as a three. So... Um, right. But just the same, USAC changed their upgrade uh, I know. policies entirely. So the reason why I'm doing this race is because in order, this is a two only field, and to get the upgrade points of 35 that I need, um, anything that has a flat TT, like if you can hold on in the road race in the crit, first place is 20 points, but that down to 11, you still got like five or something mm. crazy. You got a whole bunch of, I don't, much, I don't remember what they are now, but you got a whole bunch of points. So it's it a like, good way to get points. I'm going to fly around the country and do. Cat two only stage races with flat, flat TTs. TTs that are, uh, yeah, that, so it's all time based then. But they changed the rules on me, which is actually, I think, will be a benefit. Yes. And I want to go over a few changes Let's in the it. rules. Yep. First, there's no Cat five anymore, there's only novice. And what novice is, it's a self selected group. So if you don't want to ride novice, you can go right to four. And I think this is uh, actually all these rules, even though they don't benefit me the most, I think they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. So the. The novice is cool because you get to be, if you're a truly a novice and you want to be in the novice group, you can do it. But if you're not, you're a triathlete, a mountain biker, like <laughs> you'd be a pro mountain biker. You come in, you're racing with cat fives. Yeah. Yeah. And what happens is the novice people, they just they start and they see these people that are like, should be cat ones. Mm -hmm. And they start racing with them. And you're like, what is this? You can't <laughs> develop. You get dropped right away. Yeah. Or uh, just like the race splits up and you're like, this is impossible. Yeah. Uh, or the other side of it, you have to do 10 races before. And that can be really cost prohibitive for certain yeah. people to do 10 whole races in a year yeah. if they have to travel. Depending on where you're at, yeah. Yep. So I just want to... Um, is that, I think that's the single best idea USAC's rolled out in the entire time I've been a coach. Yeah. To have a it's novice fantastic. category. I want to say me versus me. So me when I was a true novice and me when I was still forced to race Cat 5 races because yeah. I was the same person. I mean, but different rider. Yeah. Me, when I first started, I had my Mozzie. I had hairy legs, a 2 on 30 FTP, and I think I maybe even had a tri kit on my first like road races. <laughs> nice. Sleeves? And then no sleeves. Nice. <laughs> oh. Solid. Yeah, I remember you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah. That guy. Uh, and then for me in the same, like, because I hadn't had enough upgrade points in Reno. Sure. Me with my 
S Works Vanish skin suit, wax change, arrow helmet, 340 <laughs> FTP, like trip socks. Yeah, trip socks. <laughs> They're uh, actually glued into place. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's the same person, and I'd be in the same category. Um, Pretty ridiculous. Exactly. And it just makes that's funny. The 230 me, I would have seen that and been like, this is impossible. Yeah. Right? Um, obviously, it is. Sucks. But you don't want to just throw people in there. Um, so that's really good. Second thing they did. Circuits or crit, circuit, and road races and stage races get the same amount of points. And what that means is before, road races were weighted heavier than crits or circuits. And the stage races, if you won the overall on that, way more points. Mm -hmm. Now they made them all the same. Mm -hmm. And so instead of getting 20 points for stage race win, it's just like another stage. Yep. You might get seven points depending on the amount of people. Nice. Um, so crits and circuits, you get more points. Road races, you get a little less. And stages, you get a lot less. Yep. I think what this does makes it way easier on USAC to figure out how many points you have because yes. they don't they don't know which is annoying and they leave uh, it up to us <laughs> yeah so i'm hoping that the they're calculation gonna, this is, is not an easy thing no, well it will be now it because will now yeah it's always been tough though there's yep. that so they can just say anytime you race it's the same unless it's a tt tts you still get no points um the other one is you get points which for, uh, <clears> i want to <throat> clarify it's just a non-mass start is where you get basically no points so a tt yeah. falls into that and i think i don't know if they're going to have like grand fondos get points but to me those are such a big field it's weird i don't really know yeah. um the other one is you get points for anyone that is in your field scored together so before if it was a 35 plus 3 4 race and you're a three you'd only get points for the people in the three in the race and i'm literally at the start line saying raise your hand if you're a three because I have no clue, sure. and I can't look it up. So I'm like, how many people are there? Okay, there's five. That means the points go three points deep, and this is how – that means that it changes my race strategy yeah. rather if there's 21. And you're still racing against all those yes. guys. In my opinion, race promoters, like you should definitely – because this is up to the discretion of the race promoter. If racers are racing together at the same time on the same course, they that should, that should represent the entire field size because – it, it, I think so. For categories, yeah, but for masters and elites, which they're combined many times, you're still not necessarily. They didn't explicitly state anything. John, John has a race coming up. It drives so, me nuts. This no, is, this because is, like, here's the deal. But think about this. Like, if hard. I'm racing against somebody, why should I not? Why mm -hmm. should it not? But like, their placing should matter because otherwise, if, even if you start them at like one minute waves, you're still gonna end up bleeding together, racing with those people. There's no way to keep it separate. So why would you keep the scoring separate? It doesn't yeah, make any it's sense. It's a fair point. Yeah. So anyways, now in the 2-3 race, the, the, this, what this means is that all the fields will be bigger. And so the amount of points that you uh, can get will be easier. And this allows people to move up categories faster. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, again, a, a great change that I like because getting people in the appropriate category faster eliminates that, like, that cat one person who just cleans up over and over and over again. Yep. And you got to race so much. You get in the category you want, or you you get stuck at, and then there's a point where you're probably not going to get place anymore, and that's your appropriate category. Um, or, I mean, once in a while, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or you get to be cat one. So what John's talking about is when there's a an asterisk, and they're not scored together. And sometimes they'll do that where they'll put women's racers with uh, men's racers in, like, a 4-5 race. And in that situation, they want the women still to be able to get points because if they were put together, they might get beat by the men. Or they, I've seen a lot, too, they go 65 and 55 together, where usually there's a pretty big drop-off between 65 and 55, and they still want the 65 people to do it. But because of the day, there's not enough time to do races the whole time. And 65 mm -hmm. might have five people, and 55 might have 10 people. Um, totally understand. Yeah. But if they're going to be raced together, they should be scored together. <laughs> okay. It doesn't make any sense otherwise. Um, so. There's still the rule. That there's a little, like... Uh, confusion at the beginning and then they updated it there's still the rule that 10 masters points to cat one still so for me to get my cat one upgrade i still only have to do 10 points and no you can only get 10 points for masters yeah. racing yes exactly yeah. so which i was so you can't just do all it. masters racing and get a cat one upgrade exactly yeah. and i i don't like that rule because i think if you're 55 you're winning national championships in 55 and doing that you should be a cat one 55 year old huh? just like wh wh why not um some people will say this makes it easier to upgrade, and it does. But, Chad, back in your day, you had to get 35 points in 12 months. Mm -hmm. Right now, you have to get 35 points in, in three months. Three uh, yeah. no, There's a bummer to watch years. them. Oh, sorry, three, three years. years. Yeah. yeah, there's a bummer to watch them wipe away. Because oh, yeah. you could be within arm's reach of it, just a couple points. But for whatever reason, you can't race anymore that season, or you just don't have good races. But your whole season went well up to that point, and that all goes away. This is like how, 10 years ago, more than that? 2000, yeah, about 10 years ago. Yeah, so Eight, I don't hear the ago. people in between then saying like, oh, you're not a real cat one because you didn't do that, right? Uh, so this is this is I, still good. Um, mm -hmm. But the other thing that I think is good for us here in Reno 
And this is, they don't have this on their rules, so I'm not really sure. It used to be in the rules, and now it's not. I don't know if it was a mistake. But you can get your points from local race series, as far as I can tell. Yeah, as far as we can tell. We don't so know for sure. Before, there was a rule that said you cannot get, you can only get 10 points for your 2 to 1 upgrade for, uh, only 10 can be from Masters or local, weekly local race series. Hmm. So we have a weekly local. As long as it's USA sanctioned. Yep. USAC yep. sanctioned. Mm -hmm. So this means that I could get more than 10 points racing crits in Reno. Sure. And we have, uh, what, a 1, 2, 3 field. Mm -hmm. There's still Cat 1 people in it. Um, very fast people, but I could get them from that without having to drive to California each time. Yeah. This is this is the way <laughs> yes. for, for me to get an upgrade. Yeah. Um, the other cool thing is you get mandatory upgrades. If you win three races with 21 plus person field and a three or two upgrade and 50 plus and a one upgrade. What this so if you're a cat three and you win three races with a field size over that, you get bumped. Yep. And hopefully because of the new way that it like simplifies it, they can just make this automatic. Mm -hmm. Like this should just be an email to you that happens. Um, the cool, the crazy thing about this is you can go from cat four to cat one at tour of Americans Dairyland. Yeah. And yeah. like in the nine, it takes nine races to get to cat one. <laughs> if you win each one, theoretically, Ju you could Justin Williams. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> he could do that. Uh, everyone, probably no one else. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think we're going through this. It's just, I think it's a very good way. Yeah. yeah. This is all, the, those are all my notes. So anyways, it's pretty exciting. So yeah. if you, yeah, you work, yeah, if you were close, check your points again, recalculate them. I, I have a spreadsheet that I just set up that doesn't have anything fancy in it at all. But um, USAC, remember, USAC doesn't track any of your points for you. Uh, so you have to track them. So I just have a spreadsheet that I update myself. And road results is a good, um, this is for USA people, but uh, road results is good. I, I would have upgraded so much faster to Cat 2. Like mm. if this was last year, because so many times I'd be really, there'd be 10 people instead of 11, but it would be a mixed field of like 21, mm -hmm. uh, which would be another bump up. And then with the new rules, it'd be more points, mm -hmm. but oh well. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, should we go into some live questions? Let's do it. Okay. Uh, Doug says, uh, I'm 25 year old newbie, 291 watt FTP at 3.88 watts per kilogram. That's not newbie. That's not a newbie. Or, or maybe you are a newbie. You're just really fast newbie. Yeah. Fast newbie. So uh, congrats on that, Doug. Uh, says, and about to start crit racing, I can corner surprisingly well. Do I sit in and save energy or push on and use it to break away? Uh, so that, that's, uh, we actually covered that. That's always the question. Yes. That's, mm -hmm. we kind of covered that in the latest video where we talk about, um, what to do in your breakaway, um, uh, fails, and then you try to sprint for it. And then also in the previous race analysis, one with my three, four race as well, we talked about positioning. We talked about that because there was a, a there's a chicane in that course where I could use that chicane to my advantage and get a gap. And then the question is, what the heck do you do with it? If you do get a gap, yeah, it's just lots of fun options. Yeah. Um, so in my opinion, you just treat that as an ace kind of like in your pocket. And then when you, when the timing is right, you use it. That doesn't mean that you use it every lap. Uh, my mind instantly goes to the world champs women's cyclocross race with, uh, with Celine Del Carmen yeah, Alvarado. When such she, a satisfying race. Yeah. When she very cleverly sagged on that last lap, when they came up to that big run up. She sagged she off the back it. and everyone was like, oh, she dropped. She never rode that before. But then at that moment, she rode it. She like saved that. And then that allowed her to get past into second, descend with more momentum, be a little bit fresher. So like it's, it's always about if you do have something like that, you don't necessarily want to show your cards all the time. You want to use it when uh, the opportunity is right to get the gap or to get some sort of decisive advantage. That's what I would say. Anything else that you guys would add? Yeah. So, Doug, uh, can you – about sitting in or trying to push to use a breakaway – can you position yourself for the sprint and can you sprint? If you can't do w mm. both of those things, don't wait for the sprint. Yeah. Um, and again, with these new rules, you just do cat four. I don't know what you're, where you're in cat five, but at 291 watt FTP, if it's a flat course, that's not enough to be like a solo breakaway, at least in NorCal racing, even in cat four. Mm. But I would say if someone goes in front of you and you get a free ride, go with them um, because sure. that's, it's probably going to, be the same amount of energy as like the pack chasing usually. Um, but, but if you can sprint and you can position yourself and it's, those are two different things, right? Uh, sure. cause you got to do both. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and two, you don't know what you're doing. So I would, uh, at different races, I would try different things. I'm like, mm -hmm. try to be in yeah. a breakaway a whole bunch of times. I think he's in a perfect position to be the guy who doesn't rush his upgrade because he can do both these things really well. He's not trying to get out of fives anymore. He's get, he gets the starts start in the fours. So I would do a little bit of everything. Just have a ball. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, a couple other questions here. One from Aaron says, uh, Hey guys, I've got a question about babies and kids. My wife and I are expecting our first child in April. My typical short track mountain bike race series I train for lands around the end of May and early June. I expect to lose a lot of sleep and even lose training time. Yes. Uh, yeah. He says, what are your tips for <laughs> and an hair? <laughs> and, yeah. What are your tips for an expecting <clears throat> father trying to still race or should I just forget about race, uh, racing this series? And loom to the loom it loom to the cyclocross. I think he means look to the cyclocross series in the fall. Uh, Nate, what yeah. would you say? I would say um, you ought to be okay with losing fitness. Both times with when my kids were born, I just stopped completely. Uh, but if I wasn't going to stop, what happens? So you get up in the night to feed, and sometimes if you get up at like three or four in the morning, you are up yeah, it's the a, rest of the time. Can't go to sleep. So I would say. <laughs> Um, I actually use that time to work on trainer road cause we're building the company at that time. But I would have, if I was focused on racing, I would make sure whatever my bike setup is, I could do it in a way that wouldn't wake up the rest of the house. Mm -hmm. So those mornings like that you do wake up at four and you're ready, take advantage of it, do a workout. I'd be more flexible with my time schedule. So when I have extra time, I would bump up my volume and then I'd also be okay with the 30 minute workouts when the I don't have versions. Of yeah, the exactly. Not have a, when I don't have a lot of time knocking it down to be shorter and just being cool with that. Mm -hmm. And if you even talk about a lot of times, it doesn't take a lot of, um, a lot of work to maintain, but it does take usually a good amount of work to build. Yep. So just maintaining or even just not losing a ton, um, is a win. And if you think about it that way, sure. it's not so bad. You just gotta be careful too with sleep because sleep is going to be, um, oh, every baby's different, but whew, with my, this is my first kid. It was not a lot of sleep. Yeah. It's so, uh, the only, or the things I would add to that are if you are following plan builder or you're using plan builder to build out a plan, you can always adjust the training plan volume that you're in at that moment. You'd basically just click on the notification on your calendar where it says your training phase has started. It'll say build or base or specialty. And then you can just change that to low volume. I would absolutely recommend Aaron. I don't know if you're on a low volume right now, but if you're on a mid or a high, something like that, I would absolutely recommend going to a low volume. Yeah. Highest, uh, they would be really hard. Um, so because th that will just give you a little bit more flexibility, and uh, also don't beat yourself up over it because this is going to be a really stressful time. Mm -hmm. So don't beat yourself up over that because that'll just make that'll have an effect on everything else, and you don't want to tarnish the you don't want to be upset during this time when you have a first child because your training isn't going correctly, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and, I, and I know I harp a lot on getting adequate sleep, but there are situations where it's just not going to be an option. Yeah. So don't, don't sweat that either. I mean, you may not perform at your best. You may be sick a little more often than, than, than usual, a but lot more. <laughs> yep. don't, yeah. don't worry too much about usually, it. The sickness happens when daycare starts or school starts. At yep. the very beginning, you're usually pretty good. Um, but the other, the, it's to, to, to pick back on what you say, it's the it's your mindset because yeah. if you're stressed about mm -hmm. all, that That's, raises your cortisol. And that's exactly what I'm getting at. That does not help. So and just, not just the cortisol, just, I mean, everything negative that goes along with stress. I mean, yes. training is stress. Having a baby is stress. There's all these other types of stress you don't need to incur more by putting this pressure on yourself to by fretting over your sleep and by fretting over your drop in performance. And for that reason, I think that it's, in my opinion, Aaron, what I would do is for that mountain bike short track series that you have, I would not put that as a priority to be able to compete at those races because I know like early on, we just have one child, but when he was born, my wife was not eager to come to a bike race and to help me out or, or just have mm -hmm. me disappear and go to a bike race. Even though a short track series could be really quick. Um, I, so I actually just kind of took racing, mm -hmm completely off my calendar and I'll reassess once I get to a point where I feel like I can reassess. And that was really helpful because I didn't feel like I had any pressure that was going to make any more of that stress come along. Sure. It's just, it's just hard because like, like there is no manual and like, like with a child and like Nate said, it's entirely different for each one. Uh, not just for each family, but each child within that family will be different. So who knows? It may be super easy for you to train and your child may sleep really well and you may have the best fitness of your life, but you may not it's better to at least give yourself the flexibility to be able to race if you want and have good fitness if you want, but not require it. So um, this is for everyone too, like different people, different goals, but have, it's okay too to say, I'm going to take six weeks off and then start over and rebuild for next season. Yeah. Like that's fine. You can still even do this race just with less fitness and mountain biking's fun. Totally. Um, and this applies to people that are just busy <clears throat> in general. This doesn't just apply to parents, like, yeah. you know, whatever you're looking at. So the other thing too, that works really well is, uh, you take up running um, during this time, if you get a stroller and just whoever your partner is, man or woman, um, 
babies are so much work, but when you can put them in a stroller and you can go, one, sometimes they look around, other times they just sleep, yeah. but you can get a 45 minute run in. <laughs> um, so easy. And it's then nice. the other person can be at home and they're either relaxing because they're exhausted or getting things done where they couldn't get done with the baby. Yeah, I um, say so easy. Running is never easy, but uh, <laughs> like it's easy because you can actually combine those responsibilities that you have. My son loved stroller time. My kids, my kids still it. love stroller time. Now yeah. they're riding with their bikes yeah. like next to it. But uh, yeah, it, I, I love stroller time. You push me around. John. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Let's do it. Last question from Jason. Is it even worth feeling an hour or feeling for an hour long uh, crit? So during, uh, she had, she says, he says it's a little backwards, but I think he means feeling during that hour long crit. I don't, uh, I, I, I still have carb drink uh, that I take in throughout the course of a crit. I don't. So you just I have water? Nope. What do you have? Nothing. Same here. I don't like the, so talking to the socialized people, the bottle, spy <clears throat> watt drag. Bottle cage is two and a half. Um, Most of the time, I can't even get to my bottle anyway. So it's kind of a non starter. Ex exactly. I do a gel right before. Um, but there is that study we're showing that, like, um, carb in your mouth, mm -hmm. like, just the sensation of having it will improve performance. Reduction RP. But to, to what Chad and said, like, I don't want to reach down. It's like a safety thing. And then the, the five watts, I just go without there it. There just aren't too many situations in a criterium, <clears throat> especially if the course is a little bit tricky where I can get to my bottle. I mean, there's so much going on in those races. The only time I can drink is if I'm in a breakaway or, or on a solo break. As I remember, it wasn't necessarily five watts across the board. Is this uh, on the Venge? Having yeah. bottles on the bench is five watts. And so that, and that's, but that's cages as well. Like, so you, you take off your cages entirely and mm -hmm. your bottles. That, yeah. If you take the bottles off and just the cages, that's two and a half watts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and front to back, I don't remember if they covered the difference between that. So I don't yeah, think, I think he's talking about bottles in both spots, but I don't, I'm not sure. Either way, you're, you're not going to be in a bad position taking your cages off. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, you don't have to. I still have it there, and it's, especially it's, if it's windy, uh, because I find that sometimes I can get. I talked about this before, but sometimes I can get a super dry mouth at like our hot, windy, dry. Uh, I just asked Jonathan we have for a drink, but in, <laughs> no, actually, I bottles. And I give him one. But yeah. in terms of running out of gas during a sixty-minute effort, it's pretty unlikely unless you come into it in a bad state. Yeah, yeah. And if you do like find yourself where you get dropped or something like that. Assuming that you didn't come in in a depleted state, it's probably not because you didn't feel enough. Nah. It's because of bad tactics or pacing fitness, or just whatever. fitness, yeah. right? So, all right, that covers it for this week. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, especially joining us live on YouTube. Uh, we'll be back on YouTube in, the, in two weeks, and you'll be able to join us then. Nate, you're going to be like an absentee podcast member for quite a while. Because you've got a lot of travel going lots on. Lots and lots and lots of travel. So, so we'll have uh, we'll have different guests coming in and out, which will be which will be fun. Um, but we'll miss you, Nate, just the same. And you can also remember submit your questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast and go to trainerroad.com if you want to become a faster cyclist. See you all next time. Thanks everybody. Bye bye.